20 council and together with children colleagues from a range of service areas to date and the group are developing three areas of activity linked to increasing the take up of cycling, redesigning and improving the home through to school transport and also social sub subscribing. In terms of project delivery, Madam Mayor, the Breeze project, which supports small and medium-sized businesses with energy efficiency measures, is now within its final six months of delivery. To date, £402,000 of grant funding has been committed uh, across 84 SMEs, with a further £120,000 of grant funding still available. Through the Warm Homes Fund, we have already assisted 148 households with energy saving advice and welfare support and are now operating on the delivery against the target of 135 air source heat pumps to electrically heated properties by July 2024. A programme of work has been developed with BEI Communications and Nomad to accelerate decarbonisation of the council's operational estate following a successful digital capital proof of concept project. 14 buildings have recently been identified for this programme and initial survey work has taken place. Work commissioned from a consultant to assist with the development of an electronic vehicle infrastructure and an assessment road path for Sunderland, for Sunderland has recently been completed and an EV delivery plan is now being finalised. The roadmap takes an evidence-based approach drawn on the work of the consultants, taking into account existing charging infrastructure and opportunities for growth on a city-wide basis to support the needs of residents and key stakeholders. One early action in this delivery plan will be a city-wide feasibility exercise on EV residential community hubs, which is due for completion in March. The on-street residential charge point pilot scheme has been completed with two charges installed at each of the following locations. Market Street, Hetton, Harbourview, Roker, Morgan Street, Southwick, Ocean Road, Grangetown, and Allingham Road at Lakeside Village. Linked to decarbonisation of transport in terms of the Council's fleet, the EB, EV hub at Pearson's Depot now has 25 fast charges and five rapid charging units installed prior to occupation. This will support phased decarbonisation of fleet based on operational requirements and the availability of appropriate technology. On micro Mobility, a new partnership has begun with Zwings for the new e-scooter provider for Sunderland. Zwings has initially deployed 100 e-scooters across the city and this number will increase during the year. The e-scooter trial is scheduled to run until May 2024. On the 1st of December, the Low Carbon team worked with teachers and nightly pupils from St Anne's and St Cuthbert's RC Primary Schools and Broadway Junior to plant 150 trees within their respective schools. The trees have been grown from acorns and horse chestnuts by a local resident in South Hilton, who is keen to support environmental education, as well as the council's work on carbon reduction. And many of the school children, school children responded by sending letters of thanks back to the local resident. Planting plans for a number of sites across the city as part of our commitment to the North East Community Forest are also be, currently being developed. We also now have the new <coughs> recycling shop called Revive, which has opened as a household waste and recycling centre in Pallion, which is operating now seven days a week. All proceeds to go to St Vincent's to help support the most vulnerable members of our local community. And finally, I'm delighted to report that Councillor Roundtree has just, just graduated from the UK's 100's first Climate Leadership Academy. This has provided extremely valuable opportunity as part of a cohort of 20 elected members leading on climate action across the UK, to hear from a wide range of experts, to share knowledge and to take part in an extremely valuable and a comprehensive programme of workshops and development sessions on everything from biodiversity and retrofit, retrofit through to green jobs. As the first North East Council to be selected to take part in this Climate Leadership Academy, I know that it will continue to provide a valuable forum as we all work together to achieve our ambitious goals both as an organisation and also across the city as a whole. I hope this provides a useful, positive update on the work that is ongoing within the Council and within our partners and the progress made to date. 
We will continue to develop our work in this area on an ongoing basis and provide updates to the Council as appropriate going forward. And I'll just finish up by, uh, by saying, uh, Madam Mayor, is wow, just so much going on in relation to carbon reduction in the city. And I think we all need to be proud of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Can we note the update from the Cabinet Secretary? Councillor Can I ask a question, Madam Please Mayor? Please do. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks to Paul Stewart for the update. Um, at the last meeting, we asked about electric vehicles, and Claire Rantry arranged a meeting, which was very helpful. Um, and there's some welcome things in your statement about on street charging and places, you know, where, where you don't have a drive. But I think those locations that you mentioned are all kind of terraces or on street. And our concern was for um, estates like Grindon, Thorny Close, Springwell, whether they could be included. So I wondered whether the Covenant might look again before that strategy is published just to make sure that those places aren't going to lose out. And um, I also met with residents at Greenside Court in Thorny Close, which is a kind of shared housing complex with 22 properties for over um, 55s, and they were interested um, to see whether there was any opportunities to be a trial for kind of a shared housing complex and how they might um, look to get a charger installed. And I wondered whether we could arrange a meeting with an officer or with Claire Roundtree and residents of that accommodation to see if there's any opportunities to move that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Can I just ask you to raise your hands again, those who wish to speak? Thank you. So, Councillor Mullen, Councillor Doyle, Councillor Reid, Councillor McDonough, Councillor Hartnack, Councillor Morrissey, So, Madam Mayor, that's Councillors Mullen, Doyle, McDonough, Reid, Hartnack and Morrissey. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mullen, would you like to start, please? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Just to ask the Cabinet Secretary to comment on the uh, £19.5 million levelling up grant won by NECA for the electric buses and to tell us how that will benefit Sunderland in particular. Will it bring more bus routes online or is it to replace existing bus routes? if you can just outline what the benefits are. And also, if you can tell us if any members of the Cabinet in Sunderland contributed to the writing of that bid. OK. Right, we'll go through all the questions first. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate the information that the Cabinet Secretary has presented regarding the e-scooter trials and uh, improvements to EV infrastructure. But uh, I was wondering if perhaps he could provide a more detailed progress update on strategic priority five of the low carbon action plan as it relates to active travel and specifically how confident is he and the, uh, the deputy leader, I suppose, as well, of achieving a meaningful modal shift towards active travel by 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McDonough. Oh, sorry, Councillor Reid was there. Councillor Reid. I don't Reed, want to miss me out, Madam Mayor. Um, a point that I've raised in several meetings is sort of the need to accurately measure and calculate carbon capture and carbon sequestration levels in the city so that we as a, as a council can accurately measure how much carbon we're putting out and how much we're taking in so that we can hit our net zero targets. Could I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline what this Council do and is doing to measure accurately how much carbon and greenhouse gases we are taking in and the capabilities that we're investing in to, to sort of take that forward and if it is possible to publish those statistics on a bit more of a regular basis so that we don't have to wait for a sort of a lengthy update in Council Cabinet so we can look at the statistics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McDonough. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, two questions. Um, why has there been no public consultation with Lakeside residents regarding the EV hub plans? There are some major concerns around parking, which is obviously it's already a, a big, big problem uh, in my area. And also, um, when will the environmental impact report on the air show be published? Thank you. Councillor Hartnack. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I recognise the importance of aiming for carbon reduction and note the work the Deputy Leader is undertaking with 19 other councillors from across the UK. Um, I wonder if um, the Cabinet Secretary, on behalf of the Deputy Leader, 
um, can explain the extent to which this building, this building exploits renewable energy, for example, use of solar panels or other renewables, and what influence did she have in respect of designing in carbon reduction measures into this building design? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morrissey. Thank you, Mayor of Sunderland. Um, there's been some very encouraging developments with the um, city centre mine uh, water heat network um, currently being developed at Weymouth Colliery. Um, I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary if you can tell us if the buildings on this site are going to be connected to that, and if not, why we're allowing the installation of gas boilers um, in city centre buildings, which is in direct contravention of the city strategy. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, would you I, like to I do believe it's going to be a rather short reply. Yes. <laughs> uh, as you will, will all be fully aware, uh, the, the, the remit for, with regards to, to the, the carbon agenda is Councillor Rountree, who is not here to, today. Uh, so what I, I will do is ensure that your questions are, are taken back uh, to her with regards to, to ensuring that you receive a reply. But what I would say in relation to some of the, the, the comments is it's, it's a bit rich uh, from, from some members who stood here not uh, less than a year ago and voted down a budget, and in particular voted against our decarbonisation fund yeah. of a million yeah, pounds. Yeah. Is this helped to achieve some of the things we're doing? Well, you will get a reply. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in light of the written responses that you're going to get, can we now agree the update? That do. Thank you. The next item is reception of petitions. Do we have any members with petitions to present? Councillor MacDonough, oh. Councillor Vera, Councillor Edgeworth, Councillor Farthing. So, Madam Mayor, that's Councillors MacDonough, Vera, Edgeworth and Farthing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor MacDonough, can I ask you to present your petition, please? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have two petitions to present today. Um, I have one from 107 residents, uh, which says, We, the undersigned, call on Sunderland Council to install a safe crossing point on Silksworth Road in Hurrington in the form of a pelican crossing or zebra crossing. And I also have another from uh, the residents of Lakeside, 124 signatures. We, the undersigned, called on Gen 2 and Sunderland Council to work together to install more parking spaces around Lakeside Village and the Towers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vera, would you like to present yours? Good evening, Madam Mayor. I've um, got a very large petition here. Uh, it's about 5,000 names here, 136 pages, so it's a very large petition and I'll read it out. It's on behalf of the lead petition with Alan Boxley. The petition reads as follows. Coal Kitchen is one of Sunderland's success stories, a business with a five-star rating for hygiene, excellent reviews, clearly meeting community needs. Attributing people to the area due to this reputation of high quality, locally sourced produce and customer service. It operated as a takeaway for over two years under COVID regulations, but an application to continue as a hot food takeaway has been refused by some city development chiefs. It deserves our support and encouragement. And as I said, over 5,000 people have signed that throughout the world. Thank you, Councillor. Sure. Councillor Edgeworth, please. I've got an envelope. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a petition from residents in Hastings Hill. Uh, we, the undersigned, petition Sunderland City Council's Infrastructure Department to include the Hastings Hill subway under the A183 in the list of subways that will be fully surveyed and assessed as part of the review of all subways in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Farthing, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My petition is from residents of Hope Shield, Rickerton, in my ward. They have several concerns. One is parking and security. Another is fire, which affects just a couple of residents. Another is about a fence, which affects only one resident. Uh, one re resident, yes. And uh, another 
concerning just two properties and a third one, just one person. But the, it is fully signed, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Can we agree to refer these petitions to the appropriate Chief Officer? Thank you. The next item is questions from the public. I will need, now read out the questions we have received. Uh, the first one from Auburn Langley, the dropping of litter cigarette butts. Anecdotal evidence suggests that women are disproportionately fined for dropping litter cigarette butts in the city centre. The council has the real figures but won't release them under freedom of information. I urge the council to improve their monitoring processes and ensure that any unintentional misogyny is eradicated at source. Will the council release the figures and produce an action plan to retrain staff if appropriate? Um, Councillor Rowntree was responding to that. Cabinet Secretary, are you? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll respond on behalf of Councillor Rowntree. Uh, all details of fixed penalty notices issued for the offence of littering are stored on an access database. We will record the particulars relating to the offence, including the offender's full name, address, date of birth, and the location where the offence was witnessed. Unfortunately, we do not record the specific type of litter for which the fixed penalty notice was issued. On the 6th of October 2022, the Council did indeed receive uh, an FY request, I'm assuming it's from Auburn, uh, which specifically asked, please could you provide the number of fixed penalty notices issued for the dropping of cigarette butts in the last year, either calendar or reporting period in Sunderland City Centre? In addition, in addition, please break down the data to reflect any monitored characteristics, i.e. race, gender, age, etc. Unfortunately, it would not have been possible to, break, to, to, possible to break down the request specifically to look at the total number of fixed penalty notices issued for dropping smoking-related litter regarding somebody's race and gender. So we therefore responded, although the Council does not hold this information, it would require a significant manual exercise to be undertaken to extract the information you have requested, which would exceed the fees limited, limit. Therefore, this element of your request has to be refused under Section 12 of the Freedom of Information Act. To capture this information moving forward, the Neighbourhood Enforcement Team has recently procured a fit-for-purpose fit fixed penalty database from Imperial, which is being built to our specifications. The database will have a function to capture the type of litter that has been dropped, which clearly uh, Auburn is after, and it's hoped that this will be built into the use by the end of July 2023. However, to provide you with some reassurance that fixed penalty notices are being proportionally issued to anybody dropping litter, irrespective of the agenda, I can provide that the total of number of fixed penalty notices issued since the 1st of April 2022 to date is as follows. In relation to the city centre, there was 241 fixed penalty notices issued, of which 128 were female and 113 were male. In relation to the city-wide, the total number of fixed penalty notices was 439, of which 223 were female and 216 were male. As previously described, we are unable to break this down specifically for the type of litter dropped. However, the litter could have included cans, bottles, paper, plastic food and drink containers, or wrapping left by food, and indeed cigarettes and cigars and chewing gum. But what the figures do show, Madam Mayor uh, uh, and Auburn, is that at the moment the figures would suggest that there does not appear to be any real bias as to the gender of the person being issued with the fixed penalty notice. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> we have a speeding cars at Roker Seafront by, from resident David Newey. Residents of the Sunland Marina in St Peter's Ward and areas nearby are concerned about speeding down the bank towards the car parks on Roker Seafront. Would it be possible to look at measures to curb speeding vehicles on this short stretch of road, both to prevent noise pollution 
to make sure that there are no accidents involving pedestrians in this busy and bustling area of the seafront. Councillor Johnson, I believe you are responding. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to David Newey for the question. It is disappointing that none of the three uh, Conservative councillors in St Peter's Ward have raised this with me. Um, and just want the member of the public to, to bring it to our attention, but I know they've been struggling lately with some reform in the party locally. Um, <laughs> so they might have been a little bit sidetracked with that as how they support residents in Washington as well as St Peter's Ward. So Please. I would like to reassure Mr Newey, though, that uh, council officers will look into the speed and air quality and road safety concerns raised and using the council approved assessment and prioritisation process, which includes factors such as traffic speed, casualty and collision history, road geometry, and together with other site specific criteria, we'll respond to Mr. New in the next two to four weeks. And I will be, of course, happy to meet Mr. New on site to see first hand issues he has raised. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Our third question is from resident Barry Robinson regarding CPO for Pallion Dry Dock. Why is the council not taking advantage of the boom in shipbuilding by issuing a CPO for the Pallion Dry Dock instead of pursuing an obvious white elephant if a film studio? And that's being responded to by the leader. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sunderland City Council can see no basis where the use of a compulsory purchase order would actually facilitate the successful development of the Pali and Shipyard site for maritime related investment. The Council has repeatedly requested sight of a business plan from various groups and organisations and this still has not been forthcoming. Fundamental to this plan is confirmation or otherwise of potential support by the site owners for the proposals and that the investment for such a development is feasible in both economic and environmental terms. Any future plans for the Pali and Shipyard site, which, I've got to repeat again, is privately owned, will presumably be subject to the site owner's own internal investment appraisals and the commercial appetite of such an investment for potential users of the facility, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Our next question is from Beth Jones, a resident of this city. Steps to make schools more inclusive. Could the leader explain what steps are being taken to make our schools more inclusive? Councillor Farthing, are you responding to this? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to Beth Jones for the questions. Oh, the question, together for children work closely with all schools and academies in supporting inclusive practice, offering support via training programmes, professional advice and head teacher and SENCO networking opportunities across all sectors, including specialist settings and, and, and alternative provision. An inclusion forum has also been established to enable schools and academ academies to meet regularly with a variety of SEN specialists uh, professionals and leaders from specialist and alternative revision settings to discuss current challenges across the city and to share best practice and development opportunities. Together for Children also ensure all schools remain compliant with DFE guidelines and legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Catherine Hunter, a resident of the Borough respite support for families of children with disabilities. Could the leader provide an update on what respite support is provided for families of children with disabilities? Councillor Farthing, thank you. Thank you, Ma Madam Mayor, and thank you to Catherine Hunter for the question. There are a wide range of respite and short break support options available in Sunderland, yeah. which are tailored to meet the differing needs of children with disabilities. Together for Children have procured a short break statement which is available on the local offer website which all members can access, local offer, Sunderland Information Point. And the, this sets out these services in more detail, including access routes and eligibility. Support which is also available to children without the need for an assessment includes Max Cards and the Fun Fund, 
which provides small grants for families to purchase their own respite and short breaks. Group-based support is provided after school, at weekends and during school holidays, including clubs delivered by Community Opportunities and the Breathing Space Programme. And again, the Breathing Space Programme is available uh, for further exploration on the Together for Children site. Children who are assessed as needing overnight respite with a team of skilled staff to support them can access residential stays at Grace House and, and St Oswald's. Family-based overnight support is also available from respite foster carers. Families can also choose and manage their own respite via direct payments and personal budgets. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. A question from Joanne Chapman, a resident of the city. Shift to using electric vehicles. Could the leader provide an update on his election promise to do what we can as a council to accelerate the shift by residents from petrol to using electric vehicles. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and uh, thank you to Joanne for the, the, the question. The Council is progressing with an electric vehicle strategy for Sunderland City Council and the wider city that sets out a clear roadmap and delivery plan to be implemented over an initial two-year period. In line with the city-wide low carbon framework and the City Council's low carbon action plan. This includes support to assist with the transition to ultra-low zero emission vehicles across the city by residents, partner organisations and businesses. The provision of electric car charging point infrastructure delivered by the private sector is promoted also where possible and the Council continues to actively seek government funding to assist with this delivery. And Joanne, if you've been listening to, into the, uh, uh, tonight, you'll also, as part of the low carbon uh, report to Cabinet, uh, we would have referenced the work we're doing, in particular with regards to residential EV uh, network and the work we're doing now with regards to introducing um, a series of EV, EV hubs within communities and work is starting on that. In addition, with regards to the new multi-storey car parks being built at Riverside and Homeside, these will host over 200 charging points for residents entering the city and 114 charging post points for the Riverside will also be available for 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Elsham Hack, a resident of the city. Cost of living crisis. Following the failure of this government to take responsibility for its actions and protect residents in need during this cost of living crisis, could the leader provide an update on how this Labour-run council is helping to keep our residents warm and provide food at affordable prices? Councillor Williams, you're answering this one. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to Mr Hack for the question. I would agree with him. This cost of living crisis can be firmly placed at the door of this current government. The increases that people are struggling with at the moment with things like utility with food with everything else that's around us is absolutely barbaric and cruel we should not in 2023 be living like this but on the plus side i have to say um, no that is the answer i'm now continuing if that's okay thank you so i would say we're working very closely with our partners to support our communities through the cost of living crisis. And in the longer term, we're committed to promoting financial well-being across the city. We're providing a wide range of advice and practical support, including issues such as finance, housing, fuel costs and affordable food. Um, if you think about food banks, which are in operation, as well as the support that's offered through our own crisis team, which could be, um, as we say here, fuel costs, vouchers to cover that sort of thing. In addition, we're working with the voluntary and community organisations. We've established 67 warm places across the city, and those warm spaces also provide a welcome, pop in, see what you're doing, but also support activities that are happening in there. There are a whole range of things, dancing, singing, uh, games, lots and lots of different opportunities, which I'm sure we all have them in our wards and hopefully you've all been out to see them. We're also working with 
the bread and butter thing, to establish a network of mobile food clubs which provide affordable groceries. Um, £7.50 for a bag of about £35 worth of groceries. Myself and Councillor Checker visited the one in Southwick just before Christmas and I understand it's going really well, yeah? Uh, there will be another four opening very soon once the places and the volunteers are all set up to deliver. So further advice and information on what the council has already put in can be found on the website. As soon as you go onto the website, there is a cost of living um, link to that. So residents can find out information. And if any of your residents come to you, I'd appreciate you sharing those details with them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, question on Silksworth Road from David Mullen, a resident of the city. Last month, the gas bog dug up a long length of Silksworth Road in order to lay new pipes, after which they laid new tarmac and tidied up the path. The whole lot is now being dug up again, traffic delayed and a terrible mess in order to lay broadband. Why hasn't the council coordinated these jobs to save many tens of thousands of pounds in materials, pedestrian and driver annoyance and local noise and mess? Councillor Johnson, will you respond, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mullen, for the, uh, for the question. Um, wherever possible, the Council endeavours to minimise disruption to its residents and the travelling public through planning and coordination of all street works. Unfortunately, collaborative work between utility companies is rare because of the unique requirements for each utility. In this instance, the gas works and fibre cable works could not share excavations, nor could they excavate side by side at the same time due to lack of road space. There could also be potential health and safety and insurance implications if such an arrangement was taken forward. The Council Highways Officers, however, through regular site visits and coordination meetings, ensure the fibre cable works are complying to the regulations, the site is safe and tidy, and disruption is minimised. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. The next question from Adele Graham King, a resident of the city, on recycling. Can the portfolio holder respond to independent findings by Nimble Finns Research? which show that Sunderland Council is amongst the worst in the country for recycling and outline what they plan to do to get us into the top ten. A cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <sighs> okay. Like all local authorities, Sunderland are constantly reviewing and assessing our recycling rate and investigating and implementing ways that this rate can be increased. We have several initiatives ongoing that we hope will see an increase in the rate over the coming years. Examples include over 5 million invested in our new state-of-the-art household waste and recycling centre in Pallion, which was opened in 2022, which has embedded performance and has an embedded performance target of 50% recycling rate, which is constantly exceeded. The site also includes a reuse shop, which pushes potential waste higher up the, the waste hierarchy than just re, simply recycling it. In 2022, we increased our number of waste education officers from two to four, with their prime function being to educate our residents on how to manage their waste more sustainably. Extensive communication campaigns throughout the year have also been taking place to promote recycling. <laughs> Bin sticker campaigns aim at promoting what we can and cannot uh, be recycled uh, also take place, and our new zero side waste policy will be fully implemented in February 23, will again increase the use of the blue bin. Following this closure through COVID, our Waste Partnership Education Centre has now reopened at Campground Reckington and has appointed a full-time education officer who will host visits and undertake school visits regarding waste management and recycling. We're also continuing to promote our garden waste collection scheme and there is now a new initiative with our recycling waste processor to allow a council operative to operate on their site to clean up delivered waste to allow more, more recycling to be, to be processed. I think, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I think we'd all agree we all must do more and uh, uh, to con continue to increase recycling in this city. And I think as a council, we will continue to look at new ideas where we can find them, uh, as such as those referenced uh, in this, this reply to achieve that aim. Uh, to ensure that we can recycle as much as we can. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, our next question 
is from Kevin Clark, a resident of the city, residents of Washington forming their own council. My question to the leader is, will you allow the residents of Washington to form their own council? Yes or no? Because surely the residents should be allowed to have a referendum to do this. If not, does the leader and his fellow councillors have something to hide if they won't allow this? And if not, let the residents have town meetings to put things to the councillors. Leader, you're taking this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Clark, for your question. It is not a matter of whether I will allow the residents of Washington to form their own local town or parish council. There is actually a legal process to be followed which is set out in law. Generally, to set up a town or parish councils, residents need to first collect and give the city council a petition. The petition must state exactly what it proposes, that it is creating a parish or town council for a defined area such as Washington and contain the relevant number of signatures. The number of minimum signatures required varies according to the size of the population of the proposed area to be covered by the new town or parish council. For example, if the proposed area has more than 2,500 local government electors, the petition must be signed by at least 7.5% of the electors. Once the petition has gathered the required number of signatures, it can be submitted to the City Council. The City Council will validate the signatures to ensure that the signatories are all electors of the area proposed and provided that the minimum threshold is met, the Council will arrange for a community governance review to be undertaken. During the community governance review, the City Council will launch a consultation asking residents to state whether they are in favour or against the establishment of a town or parish council. At the end of that consultation period, the City Council will review residents' responses before reaching a decision. The decision to create a town or parish council would be taken in full council meeting of the City Council. If the City Council decided in favour of a town or parish council, it will also set up the date for the first elections to that town or parish council. The Government has issued guidance on its website on setting up new parish and town councils and on community governance reviews, and this is available by searching Set Up a Town or Parish Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. Our next question is from Peter Walton, a resident of the city, Gritting Alston Crescent. During the long period of icy weather before Christmas, Alston Crescent was in a dangerous state and went largely untreated by council gritters. It's clear from the council's winter plan that this street is not prioritised for gritting, in spite of it being on a bus route and being a major thoroughfare to Seaburn Metro Station. Will the council urgently reconsider and include this street for prioritised gritting? Cabinet Secretary, you have this response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, treatment of Sunderland's road network is split into priority categories, with gritting operations undertaken in the strict hierarchical order that best meets the needs to keep traffic moving through the city during periods of snowfall and extended periods of uh, incremental weather. Priority one routes are those roads that are identified as main arterial routes throughout the city and experience very high levels of traffic on our primary bus routes, e.g. the A1231, Chester Road, Durham Road, Ryup Road, and Newcastle Road, etc., etc. Priority two routes are treated on completion of priority one routes and are those roads that have been identified as other main roads and some additional bus routes. Other residential and estate roads are unlikely to be treated as efforts are focused on the priority roads. Once these priority roads are deemed as clear, with other city roads still having accumulations of snow and ice, then gritters can be redeployed to provide assistance. Keeping all roads, footpaths and pedestrian areas clear of snow and ice would be an impossible task, so we'd have to treat them on a strict priority basis. 
We cannot grid the entire network or respond to every request. Therefore, we have to prioritize gridding routes to help keep the city moving. Prior to each winter period commencing, a full review of the priority routes is undertaken and consideration given to additional roads that can be deemed added to the, uh, a priority and added to the list. These additions must be considered against the resource that we have available and that response times to complete priority routes are not significantly affected. Each year we receive multiple requests for roads to be included onto our priority list. However, not all can be accommodated or upon investigation would meet the criteria for inclusion. However, I can confirm that Alison Crescent will be added to our request list and will be assessed and considered for inclusion when our priority routes are identified for the 23-24 winter season. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Our final question is from resident Peter Noble. Purchase of accommodation holiday in Washington. Can you conf please confirm if Sunderland Council are again purchasing accommodation at the Holiday Inn Washington, following a ban that residents were informed of prior to the 2022 local elections. Leader, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sunderland's housing options team do not refer homeless clients to the Holiday Inn. The Holiday Inn Hotel was used during the COVID pandemic to ensure the council met the duties placed upon local authorities by the government's <coughs> Everyone In campaign. However, the housing options team ceased using the hotel in August 2021 when this duty ended. So a bit prior before the local elections in 2022 then. The Holiday Inn has been used by other local authorities for placements for ho homeless clients under a Section 208 notice. The Holiday Inn has been used from time to time by the Council as part of its emergency response to the Homes for Ukraine programme. And I hope nobody here would have an issue with that. However, this is the exception as other accommodation options are always explored first. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you. We now move on to questions from members of the Council. Uh, Councillor Melanie Thornton, you have a question on free bulky waste removal. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Could the Leader provide an update on the proposed launch of the free bulky waste removal service planned for next financial year as promised now in manifesto? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, and I can I thank uh, Councillor Thornton for prior notice uh, of the question. This question is a good example, uh, Madam Mayor, and a reminder that uh, as local members, uh, we're here to serve the residents of the city and where we can provide the services that, that they need. During consultation on our previous uh, manifesto, the Labour Party 2018 to 22 residents requested and we promised to reduce the cost of bulky waste removal, and we substantially reduced it at that time from a charge of £25 to £10. We delivered on a promise to the residents of the city, Madam Mayor. However, during our con consultation with residents on our most recent manifesto, for the period 22 to 26, residents' views were clear in their ask to see if we could go further on that and to have access to a free service. This promise was made to our residents of the city and our manifesto, and especially now in a cost of living crisis caused by this government's incompetence, there's a real need for a service to be implemented as soon as possible. I am therefore pleased to inform members and remind them that another one of the Labour Party's manifesto pledges is to be implemented, and that from each household will be entitled to a free bulk waste collection, and that will begin on the 1st of April 2023. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Dominic McDonough, motions passed at full council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, and a very happy new year to you as well. I didn't, uh, I didn't get a chance to say that earlier. Um, can the leader please inform the council of the number of motions passed at full council over the last four years which have failed to be actioned by officers? Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor, and can I thank Councillor McDonough for the uh, prior notice of the question. I'm not aware of any issues with regards to the implementation of Council resolutions in respect of motions agreed by the full Council. However, I'm always happy to review actions taken relating to a motion passed by Council, and if Councillor McDonough could simply forward the details of those that he has concerns or queries for, I'm quite happy to work with him to determine what has gone wrong. Okay, thank you. Supplementary, Madam Mayor? Yes. Um, yes, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Very much appreciated. Um, can, can you please give an urgent update on two specific motions uh, from my side of things which have not been actioned? Um, these include the messages of hope which have not been installed on the bridges in the city after three years since we've had the motion. Unfortunately, we have had no progress on that. Um, also, the review of our relationship with Harbin um, as our sister city. Um, this has not been actioned after two years since it was passed, unfortunately. And once again, there's been no progress on that. So can we have urgent updates on those, please? Thank you. I'll just simply, in, in regards to, to, to those motions, as I've said before, we're quite happy to, to look at that and you'll get a full response. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Councillor Niall Hodson, Future of the National Glass Centre and Northern Gallery for Contemporary Art. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor of Sunderland. Um, I, like many residents of the city, was shocked at the news that the National Glass Centre will be closing uh, and its offer relocated, uh, potentially to the Culture House. Could the leader explain how accommodating the Glass Centre into the Culture House would be possible without diminishing the library, exhibition and community activity space for which the Culture House is being built? Thank you. Councillor Williams, thank you. Oh, thank you, and thank you very much for prior notice. I must admit I was shocked when the press release came from the university as well. Pardon? Well, no, my quote was put in at a later date. I wasn't aware it was going to be done. Okay. Thank you. I was unaware it was happening till the day. Okay? That happy? Fine. It would have been nice to have known before, particularly when you asked me about um, the roof a while ago, suggested you go and speak to the university. I don't know if you did. Sorry, I'm distracted a little bit. But I am answering the comments there to explain why. Oh, packed in man, you too. Um, so, we haven't given any commitment to relocate the National Glass Centre to Culture House. There's no commitment to do that at all. What we are doing is working with the university to explore if or how Culture House could accommodate parts of what is at the National Glass Centre. Uh, that would need to complement the, um, the offer and maintain our original intention for the purpose of Culture House. We absolutely can't give up on what we've planned for Culture House, but if there, are, if there is space to accommodate, that absolutely makes sense. I would hope you would agree that. So, you know, that uh, support will continue through the, the team to see where in potential the, don't know, at what point the university would want it to go. But yes, we would welcome some, but it's absolutely not taking over Culture House in any shape or form because we have our own plans for that. So it's about accommodating what we absolutely can. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hudson. Thank you, Mary Sutton. Uh, supplementary, if I may. And so, sorry, Linda, I didn't realise you were answering that as portfolio holder. Please excuse me. Um, the supplementary I want to ask, and this, in fairness, this is moving quite quickly. This is something that arose since I put the, the question in. Um, the Evening Chronicle has reported that um, there's a £45 million estimated cost to repair structural damage to the National Glass Centre, which is behind the announcement the other day. And it dates back to its original construction back in 1998. What I want to ask you, and indeed the leader, is do you agree with me that this failure demands a public inquiry? Thank you. Oh, Councillor. Goodness, I must admit, I did, I did see that information in the, the Chronicle. Obviously, we weren't part of building that. Um, the university have had it in their ownership since 2010. I think we have to look at how we move forward and see what comes out of the, the whole thing as to, to what we demand and what we don't. But, yeah, very unhappy with the situation that's in reality just being dropped on us. Thank you, Councillor. Um, 
Our next question is from Councillor Sam Johnston, Core Strategy and Development Plan. Sorry, I have missed a question out. My apologies. Councillor Peter Walker, Housing Development, Albert Place. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, could the relevant portfolio holder update Council on the impact of the Council's recent housing development that was completed on Albert Place in Washington for the Adult Social Care and SCAS service and its associated costs? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And this has been an absolutely fantastic uh, project. Um, Albert Place bungalows are a council-led development through the Housing Delivery Investment Plan where £59 million has been allocated to deliver 574, 574 new council homes. The bungalows at Albert Place were custom designed and developed for people with disabilities and challenges with mobility, as well as those who have complex support. This was a collaboration and partnership approach with housing, adult social care and Sunland Care and Support, SCAS. Four tenants moved into their new homes in 2021 with their own council tenancy. Each tenant receives 24-7 support from the on-site support provider, SCAS. Again, this is a great success story for the Council. Two of the new tenants of Albert Place were part of the Transforming Care cohort and have successfully moved from an out-of-city long-stay hospital or temporary replacement to take up their tenancy. One tenant moved from an existing placement that was no longer able to meet his needs, and the fourth tenant moved from his family home. All four tenants completed a planned transition which involved multidisciplinary teams working with the individual and the families. A key feature of the development at Albert Place has been the individualised assistive technology, which has been fitted to each property so that they're blended model of care and can be adapted in order to promote greater independence. Overall, the scheme is delivering great outcomes for individuals at a reduced cost when compared to costs for long-stay hospitals. It's difficult to fully assess the financial impact, but estimates are that the four bungalows through bespoke homes and care model saves around £1.5 million per year. One family has reported and commented to say, we are absolutely thrilled with the bungalow. It has been an absolute dream for us to find a property like this for our son. Though we have planned this for many years, it's been very tough emotionally for us as a family to take the steps towards our son's independence. But knowing that he was moving to such a beautiful home where his needs can be supported, is just wonderful and has made the transition much easier for us. The bungalow is in such a quiet location too, made it perfect for someone with sensory challenges. It really is fit for purpose and better than we could have dreamt of. Overall, the scheme is an excellent example of the Council's commitment to partnership working and providing quality accommodation for vulnerable people. Albert Place, being such a success, has led to the delivery of a further project adjacent to the current development for a further 15 self-contained apartments at the old school house and extend the model created with the first four bungalows. Madam Mayor, I'm sure you will agree with this, me, this development is flagship and extremely valuable to our vulnerable residents it's work which cannot be underestimated for both quality of life and value for money. And I'm extremely proud of the work of this Labour-led council and look forward to continuing this proactive work through the Housing Delivery Investment Plan as it continues. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Councillor Sam Johnson. Core strategy and development plan. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Will the leader of the council commit to reviewing the provisions relating to year six obesity in the core strategy and development plan following negative public reaction to the refusal to grant Cool Kitchen a takeaway licence, despite obesity only being 0.3% above the existing policy threshold? Thank you. Leader, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Johnson, for prior knowledge of the question. The Council's hot food takeaway policy was adopted as part of the core strategy and development in January 2020, following full Council approval. The policy was adopted in recognition that the obesity rates within the city are significantly above the national average and is consistent with the Council's Healthy Weight Declaration, which was made subsequently in February 2022. The Council is due to undertake a planned review of the core strategy and development plan in advance of January 2025, and will reconsider the threshold set within the policy as part of this process. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. In relation to this specific case, can the leader explain how stopping coal doing takeaway sandwiches will actually bring down obesity in St Peter's? Leader. Okay, would you mind, yeah, Councillor Johnson? To. Thank so you. In relation to this specific case, could the leader explain how stopping coal offering takeaway sandwiches will bring down obesity in St Peter's Ward? Madam Mayor, Thank you. Uh, what I will do, Councillor Johnson, since uh, you don't even seem to understand that this was a full council decision going back to January 2020, which I believe your party fully supported, and the Council's Healthy Weight Declaration in February 22, which your party fully supported, is I will get the Director of Public Health to give you a call tomorrow, Jerry Taylor's in this meeting, and she can explain to you the importance of keeping obesity down in the city. Thank you, Leader. Our next question is from Councillor Kieran Morrissey, City Hall funded and owned by Legal and General. Thank you, Mayor of Sunderland. Um, will Legal and General, who funded and own City Hall, uh, be reimbursing the Council for the catalogue of problems and failures with the building, including the need to employ an independent consultant to examine the acoustics in the chamber? Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Stewart, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And can I thank uh, Councillor Morrissey for the, the final notice of the question? In regards to the, to the funding of uh, rectifications to the City Hall post its practical completion, Bowmer and Kirkland, the contractors procured, procured to build the City Hall, have undertaken rectifications across the, built, the building at no additional cost to the Council as part of the construction contract. In relation to the chamber in City Hall, GVAV, our AV support contractor, have also made checks and changes to improve the sound quality in this space as part of their support package to AV across the building. Feedback on sound quality across the chamber is now much more positive and consistent from the majority of users. And in the last couple of months, the only issue raised has been around uncharged microphones and the power pack for this has been checked and the incident has not reoccurred. In relation to your latter point, as the chamber is being used more frequently by a range of different internal and external users, additional requirements have been identified, for example, the use of lapel microphones to enable speakers to move freely across the whole space within this chamber. If we are looking to upgrade the current system, it would seem appropriate to review what additional benefits are available as technology is always improving. It is therefore timely for us to get a sound quality assessed, in, assessed independently across a range of different chamber setups to, so that we have the accurate data on the sound range and quality produced through a range of different mediums as part of that upgrading. The consultant will be undertaking this site testing in February 2023. In terms of payment for this work, City Hall is owned by Legal and General and we lease the building from them. Under our lease agreement, we are responsible for providing the facilities management for the site and adding and testing of equipment would come under that budget as that we have set aside as part of our FM um, responsibilities, and I hope that clarifies the position for you. Okay, thank you. Thank Supplementary, you, please, Mayor. Please. What is the pound amount of reimbursement we have asked from Legal in General for moving us into a building that wasn't fit for purpose? I love the building. <laughs> I think I'll refer you, to, refer you to my previous answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Excuse me? Did you, I didn't hear what you said. I said I'm looking for a number. Okay, thank you. Our next question is Councillor David Snowden, CCTV to tackle antisocial behaviour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the Labour Manifesto last year promised a huge increase in the use of CCTV to tackle the antisocial behaviour. Could the leader please provide an update on what has been put in place and what we can expect in the future? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and can I thank uh, Councillor Snowden for previous notes of the question. The, current, the council currently has 95 4G cameras which could be deployed to tackle antisocial behaviour. Uh, some of these cameras have been purchased by specific projects or schemes, e.g. area committees, highways and so forth. Where cameras belong to certain schemes, authorisation must be sought from the project lead on deployment areas. However, Madam Mayor, uh, as part of our drive to implement uh, our manifesto pledge, in the last 12 months, the Council has invested in an additional six 4G cameras and a huge 59 street watch cameras to tackle antisocial behaviour and environmental crime in this city. These cameras are deployed on an intelligence and evidence-led basis via monthly hotspot map mapping of the Council and police data. In relation to our manifesto, Madam Mayor, the time frame for delivery is 2022 to 2026, and even though we've already had a huge increase in CCTV, I can confirm that there is more to come and that a review is currently being undertaken with regards to how that can be achieved over that time period. In addition, as part of the Council's Smart City priority, a citywide CCTV strategy is being considered. This will consider how best to use these technologies to support community safety and other priorities. Early discussions have been held with the Council's partner, BEI Communications, to assist with this development. Madam Mayor, uh, on this side of the, of, of the house, the house, whatever, uh, we just don't talk, we actually deliver on our promises, Madam Mayor. Here, here. Fr fr free pest control, free bins if they're stolen, and now a free bulky waste removal service, and we promise to get CCTV, and we're delivering, Madam Mayor. Thank well you. Said. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we now have a question from Councillor Michael Dixon, and in his absence, Councillor James Doyle will read this out regarding the Board of Gentry. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me to ask this in Councillor Dixon's absence. Um, could the leader explain, other than being a Labour councillor, what criteria is required when he has decided which elected members should take their places on the Board of Gen 2? In addition, would he agree that many councillors, despite themselves representing thousands of Gen 2 tenants, have absolutely no idea what role is played by these appointees in decision-making by Gen 2 and is something he needs to address? Thank you. Madam Mayor. Sorry, leader. The council nominates one elected member to be appointed to the board of Gen 2 Group Limited. It used to be more. It used to be three. And then it's become two. And now it's become one because the government keeps moving to remove councillors from the boards of social housing organisations altogether. And I'm sure, if not in the short term, in the medium term, the last council representative on Gen 2's board will be removed by government legislation and we'll have no councillors on the board of our social landlord. They sit as part of that board, which currently includes eight independent directors and one tenant representative, and they provide their own views and guidance on proposed Gen 2 policies and then take decisions collectively as part of that board. As members may already be aware, Gen2 is a regulated provider of social housing and a charitable community and benefit society. This means it is required by law to work for the benefit of the community and it strives to provide quality social and affordable homes to those with a housing need. For any members not familiar with the role played by these, those appointed to the Gen2 group board, they may wish to take the time to look at the Gen 2 Group Board's terms of reference, which are publicly available and currently published on Gen 2's website. In amongst other things, the matters reserved for the Gen 2 Group Board are to help develop strategic aims and objectives, to approve key partnerships, and to help set a culture which focuses on the need of current and future tenants. On this basis, any committed and experienced member who serves our residents well and has a strong knowledge of the key issues affecting the city of Sunderland would potentially be a suitable appointment and in a position to provide a valuable 
contribution to the Gen 2 Group Board. But there is only one nomination, and that position is obviously currently filled. So thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. Supplementary, Madam Mayor? Certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Please do. <laughs> uh, thank you very much to the Leader for um, his uh, answer, and clearly has a, a very significant knowledge of the Gen 2 Board's terms of reference. So with that in mind, um, could he perhaps outline what is the extent of the influence exerted by that councillor representative on the Gen 2 board over personnel decisions? Um, for example, those decisions relating to the departure and replacement of the Gen 2 chief executive. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor? Please do. I can't, I've never been on the Gen 2 board, Councillor Doyle, but uh, the councillor does so, and it is one director in ten. So that's how much influence they have on anything, be it personnel or otherwise. I will not comment on uh, an HR matter referring to a partner when I know not the facts of the situation that you refer to. Thank you, Leader. Our final question, Councillor Stephen O'Brien, reported issues not being actioned or resolved, which I will read on his behalf. What assessment has been made of the proportion of cases reported by both councillors and residents through the new reporting tools being closed without being actioned or resolved? And what steps are being taken to prevent this happening? Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And again, thank you to Councillor O'Brien for the, the question. Uh, I am not aware of any issues with regard to the closure of cases through the new reporting tool being closed without being actioned or resolved. The instructions that have been given to staff have been quite specific and have been supported with training and have been made, been made very clear that cases should not be closed without being actioned. All I can say is, Council Bryan, if you do have particular cases where that has occurred, could you please let me know and I will look into them personally for you? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We now move on to the report of the Cabinet. I now call upon the Leader to move the approval and adoption of the report and supplementary report of the Cabinet. Please feel free to stay seated if you wish. You've always been my favourite Mayor, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm not asking for any favour, folks, honest. Uh, I so move the report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, do you second the report? Second the report, <coughs> Madam Mayor, and we reserve the right to speak. Thank you. Leader, would you like to speak to the Cabinet report? Uh, there's no need to speak to the report, Madam Mayor. The report is fully laid out with the three items. Thank you very much. Thank you. I understand the Conservative Group wish to move an amendment on item three, the Members' Allowances Scheme. Councillor Mullen, is that correct? Yes, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, can we have someone to move and second that amendment, please? I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Mullen, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. The amendment is to reject the increase in allowance for the Chair and Vice Chair of Planning and Highways in addition to the other recommendations that are set out in the late sheet. The Conservative Group proposes this Labour-backed increase to councillors' allowances and urges a rethink of changing the remuneration to the Chair of Planning and Highways and to its Vice Chair, and particularly the proposal to backdate the pay for work that has already been undertaken. So my group requests that this amend amendment be supported. As ever, we oppose also the 7% increase to the basic allowance that is proposed by the Independent Remuneration Panel, and we, in addition, uh, submitted to the panel a package of proposed cuts that amounted to just under £200,000. I remind colleagues that the Conservative Group stands by our proposals as submitted to the IRP and give away any special responsibility allowances in accordance with our proposed budget cuts that we receive. Councillor Hartnack, for example, when on the adoptions panel, when that existed, used to give away 100% of the allowance because that's what we proposed cutting. Councillor Dixon continues to give away 100% of his Vice Chair of East Area funding to charity, and that is true of all of the SRAs that our group currently receives in line with the cuts that we propose. 
Finally, Madam Mayor, I'd like to seek clarity on the contents of the report. It appears to me that the Liberal Democrats don't seem to have submitted anything to it this year, given they're usual, uh, usually quite vocal on this. I was concerned as to why that is and wonder if we can have clarity on whether their policy has changed or whether something has been missing from the report that should have been published in it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, can I have an indication of anyone who wishes to speak on this amendment, please? Leader has the right of reply. Councillor Hodson. Councillor Hartnack. Councillor Hartnack. So, Madam Mayor, the speakers on the amendment are Councillor Hodson, Councillor Hartnack. I think Councillor Doyle, did you wish to speak? Did you reserve the right to speak? Uh, I have nothing further to add, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And then the leader has the right of reply. reply. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yes, Councillor Hodson, would you like to go first, please? Yes, thank you, Marison. And um, uh, I thank Anthony Mullen for in inviting me to speak. I'm very, always glad to do so. Um, my group has uh, repeatedly made uh, representations to the independent remuneration panel. What is frustrating about doing that is that um, year on year we're told that the panel has no uh, power to do anything with those, um, those representations. They have, without fail, um, not appeared in any of the panel's reports. Um, and we've been recommended by the panel year after year to simply move a budget amendment, which is what we will be doing in a, in a few weeks' time. Um, so for, for us, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's banging your head against a brick wall, frankly, uh, dealing, with this, dealing with this panel. It's very hard to get your, your message across. It's not coming through. What we say when meeting with the panel isn't coming through into these reports. So um, uh, you will hear what, what we have to say, um, and I'm, I'm sure it will be a bit of a broken record, frankly, uh, when we speak uh, at the budget meeting coming up. Um, I will just say briefly uh, on, on the uh, Conservative Amendment, my group will be happy to support that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hartnack, thank you. My apologies, Madam Mayor, I'd like to speak to the main report rather than the amendment, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leader, the right of reply. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. It's very interesting to see the, the Conservatives here trying to steal the Liberal Democrats' clothes. Who's yellow, who's blue? Or are they all just a vague shade of green because they're all feeling a little bit sick at the moment? Uh, look, uh, understand what Councillor Mullins is saying. Obviously, I disagree with everything he's saying. And uh, obviously, this group uh, will be supporting uh, the Cabinet report in its entirety, including the recommendations of the independent panel, because it is their recommendations. They are independent. And we have refused to accept the 7% pay rise as a Labour group. We said so quite clearly, and that's why we've said we will not be pushing for that. But what we think is entirely fair and appropriate is that since we've restructured the Planning and Highway Committee, which is a quasi-judicial regulatory committee in the same vein as licensing and regulatory, they should be uh, the chair and vice chair of either of those committees should be on the same special responsibility allowance, which is why uh, that has been aligned that way. And uh, we would, are disappointed that colleagues would think that that is not something that is both sensible and should be supported. But the Labour Group will be uh, fully supporting that, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we'll now move to a vote on the amendment, please. Will that be an electronic vote? The Governance Officer could start the oh, vote running, please. <coughs> right, um. <coughs> Members, the vote should be running now. So this is a vote in respect of the Conservative Group's amendment. Um.
So members, the vote will be stopping shortly. So this is a vote in respect of the amendment. So if the vote could be stopped now, please. So there are 30 votes in favour of the amendment, no abstentions, 39 votes against the amendment, and so the amendment is defeated. I um, now wish to ask if anyone else wishes to speak on the Cabinet report. Councillor Hartnack, we have you. Councillor Doyle, did you wish to? No. Councillor Mullen, thank you. Edgeworth. Edgeworth, thank you. So, Madam Mayor, that is Councillors Hartnack, Mullen and Edgeworth, and then the Leader again has the right of reply. Thank you. Councillor Hartnack, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It wouldn't ordinarily be uh, my intention to single out individual councillors in order to make a point um, with regard wasteful spending of public funds, but on this occasion I feel that I've got to. The Vice Chair of the Scrutiny Coordinating Committee attracts under this scheme £6,277 a year, and that equates to £627.70 per meeting or £120.71 per, per week. The St Anne's Ward councillor, Susan Watson, holds that position and has never uttered a word or contributed in any way at scrutiny meetings. She's only mentioned in minutes as attending. What message is this sending to the public on the eve of yet another further anticipated increase in council tax? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, councillor Mullen, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's really just to push back against what the leader said in his right of reply on the amendment. He said that this is a recommendation from the Independent Remuneration Panel, but if I've read it correctly, it was a recommendation from the Independent Remuneration Panel that they included in their report at his request. Can he confirm that, he, that it was his suggestion in the Labour submission to increase the Chair of Planning and Highways to the same level as the licensing committee because my reading is that the IRP is saying that was a request from the Labour group. He seemed to be suggesting there that it was their independent submission. Can he clarify which it is? Thank you. Leader, thank you. Well, oh, sorry. You were going to be your right of reply. My right of reply. I'll answer Councillor. My uh, apologies. Mullen. I'm having a bad night tonight, aren't I? Uh, Councillor Edgeworth, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Just a small technocratic point that the documents published um, for the February Cabinet meeting last night said that Council had approved this report for items one and two, and I thought that was a bit presumptuous for the Cabinet documents before Council had voted to say that, that they're probably right, but um, in future could Cabinet documents maybe be a bit more respectful of full Council and not assume how they're going to vote before it's happened. Thank you. Thank you. Leading the right of reply, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> Councillor Hartnack, at least Councillor Watson turns up to scrutiny, and by turning up, she's taking part in it. Not every councillor speaks. Some people, like you and I, like to speak, some don't. Uh, that should not be the measure of whether anybody is value for money in my opinion. I, I genuinely think it's a, a disgracefully scurrilous attack on a councillor who at least... Who at, who at least attends, which is something I can level the finger at several people over there where they don't. Uh, councillor Mullen, I asked for it to be considered, because, which is the whole point of meeting with the independent remuneration panel. I did not impose on them, nor did I tell them. So please, at the next full council, don't be saying it was my idea. I just asked them to consider the change in highways and planning from what it had been to what it was now, and was this a sensible way of doing it? And I left it with them to make that determination. 
at no stage. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, I'm, at least I'm getting laughs from the Liberal Democrats this evening. And Councillor Edgeworth, I'm sure the Chief Exec heard what you said. Chief Executive. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Do you now accept the report of the Cabinet? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Our next item is report on action on petitions. I understand Councillor Mann has indicated that she wishes to speak on the report. Does anyone else wish to speak on the report? Councillor Tai. Councillor Watson. So, Madam Mayor, that is Councillors Mann, Tai, and Watson. Thank you. Councillor Mann, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to thank the Director of Children's Services for swift action following the presentation of a petition from over 300 residents of St Anne's Ward. In October 22, the residents of Pennywell and the wider community were devastated by the sudden closure of the Pennywell Youth Project, which had been operating successfully in the area for decades, delivering a wide range of youth projects, training and education, a food bank, cafe and community shop, and a gathering place to combat social isolation. Many families had used the project as young people themselves, and in recent times watched their own children follow in their footsteps. The circumstances around the closure was a source of distress and friction in the community, but positive action was taken by many residents in the form of petitioning the council. St Anne's were pleased with the fast action of Together for Children and the Youth Consortium, who worked with providers to put something in place as quickly as possible to the young people left bereft of provision. As the response alludes to, St Thomas Church now has control of the building and is working on further provision while a youth club is now running twice weekly in Pennywell Community Centre. The residents understand that action has been taken but would like to see more support and more provision covering a wider range of ages and activities I would be grateful to meet with the director to further discuss the level of support provided and the needs of the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tai. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just there has been some developments, which I'm sure the, the ward councillors are aware of. That, that that's currently dropped to one session a week at um, Pennywell Community Centre, and that's simply due to Pennywell Community Centre is a, a resource that was already full back to back if you like and, and well used and, and well serviced by the community and trying to shoe horn a youth provision into that particular building in fairness that that building has been really accommodating and, and great credit to the trustees and the management of that organization but these young people are actually in the foyer of that building and they're not actually don't have full use of that building which and i'll be honest with you as a volunteer currently providing those two sessions is really really frustrating for the young people the, at the wit's end, you can imagine um, the young people that, that are from other parts of the city are, are used to a, a provision in, in that particular area the cohort we're working with can be difficult and penned into what one particular um, four years is proven very, very difficult. What I would do is I would appeal to the church to quickly work with the consortium to get that building open. I know that the building was built on church land, but it was built with council money. That's a purpose-built youth club, it's a purpose-built youth project, and it seems madness that we have a purpose-built youth project in this city that young people can't access and use. The council built it under what was called at that particular time SRB funding, which I believe was actually European funding that was, that was channeled into the city. Um, but we, we, we need to, to, to address that. I can tell you the young people are really, really frustrated. Tensions are really high amongst the young people. I'm aware, as, as, as ward colleagues for that area are aware, as the young people have actually got their own petition going. Um, and we, we, there was a discussion potentially about fetching it here at the council. The wording's not quite right on that petition. The young people need some, some help and education. I think the, the words twocked is in that petition. Um, <laughs> Is a word. So, 
<laughs> we who have signed underneath his words in that petition. So we, as the youth workers, will try to educate those young people in, in the correct democratic way to do that, which is a step forward, Madam Mayor, because yeah. there's, there's a period of time in our lives in Pennywell where the young people wouldn't have adopted this particular strategy of trying to use democracy to get, get what they wanted. They would have used other methods, and it's up to us collectively as city leaders and as youth workers to try and do the best we can to prevent that happening, try and work alongside the church and quickly get people, the young people into that building where they rightly belong. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Watson. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I've got to agree with uh, Councillor Ty and Councillor Pam tonight. Um, Pennywell Youth came into centre being uh, uh, there as long as I can remember. Uh, it was given money from SRB3 at the time to build because um, we didn't have any provision in that, that, that area at the time. Um, I've got to thank um, the consortium who's moved in to try and <coughs> overcome the loss of the Pennywell Youth project. Um, feelings is quite high amongst the residents at the moment. Um, as you say, uh, Councillor Tyler's just told you, it is now dropped down to one night a week. Um, this um, Pennywell Youth Project was, um, it didn't just cover Pennywell, it covered the all of St Anne's Ward, which is South Hilton, Nuke Side, Hilton Lane. Um, so it was a huge area. So um, the people around there now feel that they are, have, haven't got youth provision. And at the moment, we've got a lot of um, antisocial behaviour. So I think, you know, uh, we need to look, talk, uh, the council needs to work with the church to make sure that this provision is, is more accessible than one night a week. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you all for your helpful comments on this. Can we accept this report? Thank you. We now move on to the review of the council size and ward boundaries. Uh, I call upon the leader to move the approval and adoption of the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I so move. Cabinet Secretary, do you second the report? Second the report and reserve the right to speak, Madam Mayor. Leader, if you would like to speak on the report, please. Can I move an amendment, Madam Mayor? We, the, the leader needs to speak Absolutely. first and I'll come back to you. Thank you. I'll keep it very brief for Councillor Edgeworth. Uh, nothing further to say on the report. It's fully laid out, Councillor Edgeworth. Right. Thank you, Councillor, Ed Councillor Edgeworth. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wondered if I could move an amendment to the recommendation in um, item two and just delete the words at 3 p.m., um, for the extraordinary council meeting. Um, I'm part of the working group that's looking at this and, and we weren't consulted and I've spoken to some colleagues in all political groups um, who weren't consulted about whether that 3 p.m. time for the extraordinary meeting on the 22nd is the right time. It may be, but I just wonder if we could delete specific recommendation at 3 p.m. and ask the groups to have a conversation and then agree, agree whether that is the right time or whether we want it after the main budget meeting. Thank you very much. Um, as Mayor. you've moved that as an amendment, is there someone to second that? We'll second it. We'll second it. I think Councillor Miller will second Thank you. Will Just move forward but with I was, that. I was going to ask Madam Mayor that since this report's already been agreed, ask the City Solicitor, is, there, is this pertinent now? Madam Mayor, through you, um, it is possible if Council is agreeable to um, agree an alternative time for the meeting to that that's proposed in the recommendation. I think we're Leader. happy to, to do that, to accommodate. Yeah. Right. Thank you. That's that fine. That's, if, if we're happy to have a conversation, that's great. I'd also like to speak on the main report as well, if that's all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Um, does anyone else wish to speak on the report? Councillor Mullen. Right. Councillor Edgeworth, you first. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just quickly, uh, um, being a fairly constructive um, working group looking at this, just wondered if the leader could comment um, if more 
members of the Conservative group agree with Councillor Donaghy that they are out of touch locally and nationally, and join Reform UK, would that derail this process because we'd have to consult with a new political group on this council? Councillor Mullen, please. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I shall ignore that. Um, the Conservative group is very pleased with the way that the Boundary Review Group has functioned thus far and wish to thank Lindsay Dixon, Stephen Ballantyne and John Beanie for their work in putting together the different uh, and various drafts of the initial submission that we've had the chance to read. Um, as far as the council size is concerned, though, the Conservative group's position is that we've now seen enough evidence to have concluded that there is no basis for an increase in the overall number of councillors in the city, and on the contrary, there might be a case for a reduction in the number of councillors following on from the evidence that Councillor Mordy brought to the last session. Um, at previous meetings of the group, the leader has advocated for a European model of local government with up to 100 councillors. And so in that spirit, I'll be joining the meeting next week via teams from Paris, where I'll be conducting field research to better understand how the Europeans do it. And at that meeting, I hope that all parties will be able to agree with us that there is no legitimate basis for increasing the number of councillors in the city. As a final point on the report, I agree with what Councillor Edgeworth has said that the 7 p.m. start, sorry, the 3 p.m. start time seemed a bit self-indulgent and inappropriate for people who work. And I would suggest, on behalf of my group, that 7 p.m. following the budget meeting would be much more appropriate. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you reserve the right to speak. Do you wish to speak? Sorry, Madam Mayor, no, I'm fine. Nothing to say. <laughs> Leader, do you wish to exercise your right of reply? Of, of course, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Edgeworth, you're getting my gold star for being cheeky this evening. Everything <laughs> you've said, everything you've said, I've, it's put a smile on my face. This side of the chamber has always known they've been out of touch. You catch up. <laughs> just, just catch up. Come with us on that journey. Uh, I am pleased in all seriousness that this working group has worked very well and it has been collegiate and fully cross-party uh, and that so far it seems to be doing its job. I would hope, Councillor Mullen, that you're, you're not going to use the Rishi Sunak excuse of having to get the private jet to Paris so you, can, <laughs> so you can get back for your ward business later in the evening. Other than that, enjoy it, but I'm sure this process will give us a proper uh, presentation on what we think Sunderland should be going forward. So with that, Madam Mayor, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I now ask you all if, with including the amendment regarding the time of the meeting, do you accept the report? Agreed. Thank you. The next item tonight includes a report of the Leader on special urgency decisions and a report with a supplementary report on appointments. We will take these in turn, starting with the Leader's special report on special urgency decisions. Leader, would you please move the report? I so move the report, Madam Mayor, and there have been no special urgency decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, do you second the report? Second the report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Does the Council agree to receive the report? Agreed. Thank you. Next, we'll deal with the report and supplementary report on appointments. Leader, would you please move the reports? I so move the report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, do you second the reports? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I do indeed second the report. Thank you. Leader, do you wish to speak to the reports? No, no Madam Mayor, it's fully laid out, as is the supplementary. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak to the reports? Are the reports agreed? Agreed. Thank you. We'll now move on to the notice of motion, environmental impact of council cars. I call upon Councillor Mullen to read and move the motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've moved the following motion. 
Council notes its point, commitment point of to order the Conservative motion, then? Group's 2019 motion declaring a climate emergency. Sorry, excuse me, Councillor. Sorry, I didn't. Yes, sorry. I just want to clarify on this uh, on on this motion um, under the I think it's uh, procedure six of the the council's um, constitution, which regarding the use of uh, mayoral vehicles. I just want to clarify as. Those are specifically to benefit the mayor, the deputy mayor, the leader, and the deputy leader. Um, is there any conflict of interest in um, yourselves <laughs> being in the room and being able to vote on this um, this motion? Right, we have discussed. Can we get some advice yes. on that? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you, um, while members may wish to make it known that they avail themselves of that facility, it does not amount to a disposable pecuniary interest. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, please. Thank you. Second time lucky. Uh, Council notes its commitment to the Conservative Group's 2019 motion declaring a climate emergency and reaffirms that commitment. Following the cancellation of the Sunderland Air Show for environmental reasons, Council resolves to take further steps towards net zero by reducing the use of Council-owned cars, specifically Within the next seven days, cease use of the Council's chauffeur-driven cars for the Mayor and the Executive, irrespective of leasing arrangements, encouraging use of public transport and active travel instead. And to end the delivery of Council agenda and meeting packs to Councillors' home addresses, and instead have them served in a digital format as standard, unless members opt in to receive hard copies. When members do opt in, Agenda and meeting packs will be deposited in members' respective group rooms, not delivered to their homes. Thank you. Councillor Doyle, do you second the motion? I second the motion, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Mullen, do you wish to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd like to begin, perhaps surprisingly, by thanking Paul Stewart. Because at the last meeting of Council... <laughs> Councillor Stewart said that Conservative councillors in the room were climate deniers for asking questions about the non-existent environmental impact assessment of the decision to cancel the Sunderland Air Show. The climate denial of the Conservative group was only the latest in what is already a well-established list of people and political parties that Councillor Stewart has identified as anti-environment. The Council's resident, Green Sleuth, had unmasked in the Conservative Group's defence of one of our city's main seaside attractions a hidden anti-green agenda, and I'm grateful to him for giving us the space to reflect upon our lived experiences as people who are insufficiently green. The electric car and bike-loving part-time vegan, Councillor Doyle, was forced to face up to a reality that he had not previously considered. He, too, was a climate denier. In reflecting upon our climate denial, the Conservative group has therefore decided to seek repentance by asking that we all make sacrifices to protect our planet, and on this occasion, that sacrifice takes the form of three executive cars and several thousand sheets of paper. These proposals, I'm sure Councillor Stewart will agree, go nowhere near far enough but they are an important contribution to achieving our net zero target as a council. Nobody, except for a climate denier, could possibly defend these petrol guzzling cars roaming around our city when so many green and active travel options are available. The fact that these cars cost the city's taxpayer £42,000 at a time when the Labour Group is increasing councillors' allowances and council tax is set to go up is immaterial. The real tragedy here is the damage done to our environment by having councillors and meeting packs chauffeured around the city. So let us come together across the political spectrum, Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat, Independent, etc. And <laughs> and lead by example by saying no to these cars and to the printing costs that amount to the, in the region of £100,000 a year. Obviously, I know that Councillor Stewart will have already whipped the Labour Group in support of this motion, so this is a plea 
to the Liberal Democrats. You too have been included in Paul Stewart's list of climate deniers. Please join us in seeking atonement and back our motion to help us become a greener council and, incidentally, save the taxpayer £142,000 a year. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Doyle, do you wish to speak? I do, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you very much. And uh, as a part-time vegan, I take the accusation of climate change denial very seriously. Um, so does the Conservative group, in fact. And that's why in 2019, we pushed for the Council to make a climate emergency declaration, which has since acted as a foundation for the city's low-carbon framework and supplemental low-carbon action plan. Um, the city's ambitious net zero targets, which of course we support, therefore stem from that declaration as well. And with this motion, we are once again calling on the council to take urgent but practical steps to cut carbon emissions so that, in the famous words of the Brundtland Commission, we can meet our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. And it's in this tradition that we have sought clarity on the methods used to quantify the carbon impact of the Sunderland International Air Show and all major council events going forward. Consistency here is important, as I'm sure colleagues in the Labour group agree, as is grasp of the detail, um, though that perhaps has always been slightly more problematic for councillors opposite, um, that the leader conveniently forgets that the Conservative group voted against the core strategy and development plan in 2020 is one such example. So let us now consider what this motion seeks to do. Though first, we're calling for a near immediate halt to the use of executive cars by the mayor and executive. Um, now, I, I have the utmost respect for you, Madam Mayor, and the outreach work you do with communities right across Sunderland. You have my effusive thanks for that. Uh, and it's not intended as a personal front by any means. But what is at issue here is this council's reputation for bold and decisive action on climate change and for thinking of innovative solutions to ensure we as elected members can serve our residents in a less impactful way. And if we want uh, the people of Sunderland to adopt more environmentally conscious behaviours, such as changing the way they get from A to B, then I believe the Council's most senior officials need to set a positive example and demonstrate leadership. Modal shift, a concept which uh, Councillor Stewart is so clearly familiar, as demonstrated by his answer to my question on his update earlier, is a critical part of our low carbon action plan and underpins much of Strategic Priority 5. And I see no controversy in pursuing that from the top down. The second proposal in this motion was inspired by Councillor Michael Butler, who for some time now has been relentless in urging colleagues to swap paper agendas for their digital counterparts. Uh, Michael is, of course, something of a trailblazer. And I know several members of the Scrutiny Coordinating Committee, myself included, who have duly surrendered the right to receive paper agendas as a result of his campaigning. A fine example of effective cross-party working and kudos to Michael for driving this issue. So I implore colleagues to support this motion. Certainly it signals the Conservative group's commitment to the net zero agenda. And I rather hope opposition members have the courage to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any amendments to this motion? Amendments? No. Would you please indicate if anyone else wishes to speak on the motion? Madam Mayor, we've already received prior notice from Councillor Hartnack and Councillor Scott. If Councillor Scott still wishes to speak, Councillor Ty, Councillor Butler, Councillor Peter Gibson, Councillor Curtis, Councillor Edgeworth, no. Count Oh, sorry. That's Councillor. Sorry, apologies. Councillor O'Brien. No, I know you won't get rid of me, but... <laughs> Councillor Denny Wilson. Councillor Crosby. Councillor Truman. Councillor Jay Heron. 
So, Madam Mayor, the speakers are Councillors Hartnack, Scott, Ty, Butler, Peter Gibson, Curtis, O'Brien, Wilson, Crosby, H. Truman and J. Heron. And then Councillor Mullen has the right of reply. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hartnack, would you like to begin? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I don't need to say much more in addition to that which has already been said in support of this motion. Um, I strongly um, support the motion. But a source of significant frustration to me, however, is the apparent lack of use of the electric cars parked in St Mary's car park, which appear to be rarely used. Yesterday I was engaged at City Hall for much of the day. There were nine cars uh, there parked when I arrived, and there were nine cars there when I left. And as we've arrived here this afternoon, um, at 3.30, nine cars parked. Surely if these cars have been purchased, they should be used, certainly in preference to large executive cars, especially to undertake menial delivery tasks. It makes no logical sense whatsoever to have councillor meeting packs delivered personally. How much time does this take? What about carbon emissions? I support the motion, Madam Mayor, and would urge Labour councillors and the council to practice that which they preach, in respect of carbon reduction. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Scott, please. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Scroll to my notes if you bear with me a second. It's great to see that you arrived here safely today, and I hope that you wore a seatbelt. As you already know, there are already plans afoot to ensure that the whole council fleet becomes carbon neutral, this inclusive of the cars being mentioned in this motion, and in conjunction with the plans that have been put forward by this Labour group following the declaration of the climate crisis 2019. The roles of Mayor and Deputy Mayor are invaluable to our city, and I'm, and I'm sure that opposition councillors will agree, an office held in high regard by many outside of this chamber and beyond the realms of our city itself. It's imperative that the city is represented in the best light and that our Mayor and Deputy Mayor arrive there safely and in good time and attending as many engagements as possible. The proposal laid out in this motion would result in heightened security and financial implications pertaining to the value of the chains themselves and the insurance premiums around them, albeit both entirely secondary to the potential vulnerable position that our Mayor and Deputy Mayor may face as a result of the value of the assets that they are wearing while undertaking their duties. Whilst I'm slightly enamoured by the suggestion of the use of public transport in theory, the practicality of doing so is less enamouring and counterproductive for the purpose of the mayoral office. The reality of this is that if the mayor had an engagement in her own ward of Redhill, then an engagement in my ward of Easington Lane and in Hetton, um, public transport would take a total of one hour and 13 minutes in total. Currently, this would take only 20 minutes. Of course, this is only one way, and let's assume that our next engagement will be in full wall which again is another hour and 13 minutes back in that, that, the other direction, and it would only cost, it would only be 25 minutes at this point in time. The total time lost in a single journey is 101 minutes, which is an hour and 41 minutes. Uh, if this was three days out of seven each week, the total uh, lost time equates to 1,550, sorry, 15,576 minutes, or 12.62 days lost in a calendar year. Bear in mind, the mayor travels right across the LA7, and not just Sunderland itself. The words uh, reverberate in my ear of bus back better. I wonder whose three-liner that was. An investment pot of three billion to shake up the bus provision, especially that in the red wall seats. This budget shrunk to 1.4 billion and local authorities were bidding in for, uh, for this funding in excess of nine billion. The scale of the task clearly proving too much during 12 years of Tory austerity and the decay of public services. Um, and this, just another Tory, Tory promise of levelling up, leading to another Tory U-turn. Better services whilst presiding over the managed decline in services for residents. I mean, on that note, I hope that the Conservative Government share Council and Mullins' theological sentiments of atonement by properly funding our public transport network. The final point is an interesting one. Whilst I agree that digital downloads of papers may prove useful to some members, other members may require or prefer paper copies, whether they are short of sight, whether they need Braille, again, maybe not as so much in terms of the current uh, council elect the elected members here, but large print may be required also. In saying that, one person driving to deliver nine sets of papers to Coalfield councillors, for example, would uh, a journey would start at City Hall, and to get there to the Coalfield would be 15 miles each way, covering all four wards. Let's assume that each Coalfield councillor needs to collect their own papers. There's 12 miles from Shiny Row, 13 from Houghton, 14 from Cocktail, and 15 from Hetton, and that's a total of 162 miles 
Imagine the environmental impact there. And even if one councillor per ward collected their own papers on a rotational basis, the total run would still be 54 miles. Madam Mayor, it's time for me to belt up and inform council that I'll be voting against the motion. Thank you. Thank you, you councillor. Councillor Ty, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Really, Council? Civic cars? I've really come to this as the most pressing issue of today. We've got cranes in the sky, we're building the city. We've got the worst cost of living crisis the country's ever seen. We've got families unable to feed the children. We've got the doomsday clock at 90 seconds to midnight. And we're here to waste time dealing with an outrageous motion like this as if there's nothing else to deal with. And that's why I rise to speak against the Conservative Group motion, which I believe is in a direct attempt to put, for example, the Mayor in danger, and I wish to set out why. Within the motion, the Leader and the Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party, along with their fellow councillors, oh, sorry, sorry, Madam Mayor, not their fellow councillors. I appear to see no more signatures on the notice of motion from their fellow councillors. <laughs> Madam Mayor. No idea what that outburst was for, like the others he does every single council yes, meeting. I, I'm sure I didn't hear what it was. Please I'm sure we'll deal on. with it at some point. Thank you. But I'll repeat what I say, in case people couldn't hear what I say. Maybe it's the Conservative Party's in disarray. Maybe it's the rest of the Conservative Party members have went to join reform. Who knows? We'll find out in time, though. And I'm also astounded, Madam Mayor, that the Tory opposition have given us the gift to talk about aeroplanes and the climate emergency. Now, you might not have heard, but their leader, Fishy Rishi, has abused taxpayers' money, not once, but twice already in January alone, with his jaunts using a luxury RAF jet to fly from London to Leeds, and again this month from London to Blackpool, and then Blackpool to Teesside. Was it worth it? Was it for the good of the country, Madam Mayor? No, I'm afraid not. It was to fly around his conservative constituencies, giving them a little bit of money, and the name of levelling up. Wow, climate emergency. Anyway, Madam Mayor, back to the motion. The proposal is that yourself, along with the leadership, stop using civic cars, which includes, and it's already been alluded to, a fleet of electric cars. A fleet of electric cars that are used by the leadership and yourself for commute. The proposal, the alternative proposal for you, Madam Mayor, is you get on your bike, you use public transport, or you use one of the new Z-Wings e-scooters right here in the city centre with your mayoral chains hanging from your neck. This is to get to your hundreds and other leaderships of mandatory and worthwhile meetings and events. I wonder what Mr Gove would have thought when you arrived later on your Z-Wing scooter while discussing the serious issues that this council wants to talk about. Now, let's be clear, I've got no idea how those civic chains, how much those civic chains are worth, having been donated by Nissan some time ago in recognition of the commitment to this city. I'm not too sure what they'd think of the mayor heading out on business with the chains dangling from a neck, riding up and down on a bike up Hilton Road. <laughs> there are a few big issues with this motion, Madam Mayor. Firstly, safety. The second one, public transport, and I'm not sure if my fellow councillors have looked out the windows lately, or if you're actually aware, around public transport. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Please let councillor Ty finish. The reliability of public transport due to a decade of underfunding is laid bare for everyone to see. Only last night I was at a meeting which included business leaders and our major partners for this city whose number one issue in this city was transport in and around this city and the lack of it and that we need to do something drastically about it. That's not from us as politicians, that was business leaders 
in this city who were here to speak to the chief executive and the leader and tell them what their pressing issues were. And do you know what, Madam Mayor? We all know why. We all know why public transport's decimated. It's a decade of Tory rule and lack of funding and lack of support to local authorities in regions like ours. And there's only one simple fix to that. Only a Labour government will fix that under investment. Now let's move on to the proposal to stop our electric fleet from being used to deliver the members' deliveries in favour of all 75 um, councillors. Councillor Ty, five minutes. Huh? Yep. Moving Making extension, their own. Ms. Ex Madam Mayor, since I Councillor Ty has been interrupted at least twice. I'd agree that. Yes. It's my decision. You can have the time, Councillor Ty. Thank you. So, members' deliveries in favour of all 75 councillors making their own way to the City Hall using their own cars. I'm not sure where the Conservatives get the maths from or where they learnt it, but one electric car v up to 75 cars, many of which will be using conventional fuel, is a bit of a no-brainer for me. I could go on to highlight the silliness of this motion, but let's just put it into a bit of context. It's a ridiculous motion an attempt to mislead the public from a failing party, not just in the city, but the whole country, who's fallen to bits at its seams, and its own councillors are deserting it. They've got nothing to add to this city, nothing constructive of say. They've got no ideas how to take this city forward for the next generation, focusing on rubbish like this, throwing away an opportunity to really talk about what this city should do. You know, Madam Mayor, it's just do the right thing, move aside, let the country have a general election. It's what it needs. So a proper party with a clear vision and a plan to leave the country Thank in the direction everyone. it so desperately needs. I urge councillors to vote against this motion. Point of order, Mayor Sunderland. <laughs> Councillor Hudson. Uh, under point four, uh, so part four, section 11 of the rules of procedure. I can see the way this is going. <laughs> can the question now be put? I, I feel we've only heard two opinions. I will take more, but if I find that people are simply repeating what has been said before, we will call a vote. Thank you. Um, Councillor Butler, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm not sure whether to thank the Tories for the second mention I've gotten in full council. Um, so... Yeah, there is some substance, I think, Madam Mayor, to, to part of this motion. I do, it does appear a little bit rushed. Um, the fact that they've suggested uh, you travelling to Southwick for the Christmas light switch on, of which you're always welcome, Madam Mayor. But on the number four bus, I don't think it would carry much waiting um, for the children of Southwick when you arrive on a bus. And of course, we have the security implications like Councillor Ties mentioned. Um, I did, however, notice that those opposition councillors that spoke in uh, support of, of this did have paper in their hands, um, which I may remind all members that we have the option to opt out of those papers. So I'm not sure what, what the, the purpose of most of this motion is about. Um, despite that, I think we should lead by example. Um, and yes, Councillor Doyle, I, I did uh, shame some councillors into um, giving up their paper agendas. And that is available to all councillors, and we can walk away from eight tonight and do that immediately. Um, so I would encourage you to do that, but I can't support this motion, Madam Mayor, when your vehicle and uh, transport arrangements have been suggested to be taken away. I think that's a step too far, um, and bold and brave decisions do need to be made, but they need to be made on an individual level. Um, and I'll allude to what I said before, we have to lead by example on that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, Councillor P. Gibson, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, some of the elderly councillors in this room will remember that I was mayor of the city in 2002 stroke three. As a matter of fact, Madam Mayor, I was put forward by officers in this council as Mayor of the Year. There is a competition run by 
the cooperative bank <laughs> to determine the mayor of the year for the whole country. And I was put forward by officers of this council to be that mayor of the year. And I just happened to have been reading those papers today, Madam Mayor, on another matter. During my year of office, Madam Mayor, I travelled, according to the officers, not me, according to the officers, I travelled to over 550 events in this city and surrounding area. I couldn't have gotten there on the bike. <laughs> I couldn't have gotten there on a scooter. Even if it was electrically powered. And one of the opposition members was one of the drivers then. <laughs> yes, George, I remember you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You got us lost on a number of occasions. <laughs> but, uh, Mayor, this motion from the Conservative group is absolutely ridiculous. I've never heard anything like it in my whole time in this council. This is the first time that they've suggested taking the mayoral car away from you. That mayoral car has been with the council since the council was an officially a registration council. And that registration on that mayoral car was brought from the registration council to be the council's mayor's car. Madam Mayor, I oppose this motion of... Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Curtis, please. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Right, I've listened to both sides of this. But, well, basically, I'm not going to become a vegan because I'm not giving up meat. <laughs> I'm just going to have that said. But um, there is part of this motion which I do agree with, um, and it's regarding the paper part. Um, now, one of the councillors on the Labour side uh, mentioned that um, people with sight problems might need paper. Well, I'm one of those people. I use my laptop and I can enlarge it on my laptop. So people with sight problems are better off using their laptop. If we can get people to use that, then we can cut down on the paper being sent out to people. I mean, that's what we're giving them for and they're provided by the council. So that's one way we can do things. Not only is it environmental friendly, it also cuts down on the money that we spend for the paper as well. Um, that is one thing. Um, now, I, I am conflicted about this, the part about the actual mayor's driving, because I have listened, and it does give a few security concerns as well, especially about the memorial chains, which, which she actually wears, because she does have to carry them about. Um, but knowing that, and keeping that in mind, if, what, if we've got electric cars, then we, we should be using them more because they're more environmentally friendly. So if this motion doesn't go through, can we take into consideration the paper part? And um, like, as, as my colleague Michael Butler, Councillor Michael Butler has said, um, I'm a great believer in using the tools that we've got. And as I say, the council laptop does help me quite a lot in, in, in all the meetings that I go to. Um, I mean, I still get handed things like this and, you know, it's not, nothing I can actually use 
but I do get sent them via email. I do, so I can access them whilst I'm in the meeting. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure every one of you also gets them via email as well. And as I say, it's going to cost the council less money to have things like this than to have a big bunch of, uh, uh, is it about eight, sometimes nearly over 100 pages for a council meeting? Because I did used to get them till, um, like, the member services um, stopped them from coming because I was accessing everything through email. So, I mean, you know, turning down parts of the motion which I do support and parts of the motion, I think, like, for the mayoral um, thing, I think, I don't want to use the words, but it's, that's pretty bonkers. But, you know, but um, I want to give the motion my support because of the paper thing. And I would like to have it considered to do the motion, th uh, the paper part of it, if it doesn't go through. So, like, could, like, the powers that be keep that in mind when, when this acts like at the end of this so could we just consider that and also the like with me being partially sighted i do have a mobility car and i would just like to say it's a hybrid so it's a bit of a bore and um that that's also like doing me bit as well so like i'm saving on the paper and like i'm i've got a hybrid car and it's the next best thing to an electric car so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor O'Brien. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, can I just say a couple of things? Because uh, uh, Phil mentioned this is the most ridiculous motion ever come to Council. I think you've said that about stopping free meals, <laughs> free the tickets, and other um, things we've uh, implemented before. And... We won on them, eventually. Point of order, Madam Mayor. Point of personal explanation. Yes. Never spoke on free meals. Never spoke on cinema tickets. Can please... Cinema tickets. Councillor O'Brien, remove that comment. That's untrue. He's lying. But the Labour Party. Thank the you. The Labour Party said it. He's lying again. He seems to have a bit of a habit Labour of that. Okay, thank Did you, Did the Labour Party not say not that ending free meals was ridiculous? Can we... Exactly. In fact, Can I remember Graham bringing his... Uh, Councillor like, Ryan, my I'll pass. just clarify for this point. You did say Councillor Ty Sorry, initially. I apologise. But you the do Labour mean party. the Labour group in the general. Labour group. The Labour Thank group. Thank you very much. So I remember Graham Raveney's pat lunch. Like, I'm going to wave my bus pass. Because it That's costs a handsy that. sum of £3.90 to get around the whole city of Sunderland. So maybe that's a solution for the Mayor. Uh, it is completely and utterly... Um, disgusting to hear the Labour Party of all parties talk about a hierarchical system which, which means that one person or a couple of people get to use executive vehicles whilst there's a cost of living crisis going on. Like people can't afford to heat their own home or pay council tax or maybe having the responsibility of weighing up decisions whether they're going to feed themselves. It's a disgusting attitude to take. It's horrible to hear some of the flimsy excuses that a, people cannot re respect and cannot um, use other parts of uh, transportation because you're wearing jewellery. What shouldn't be what, for, for a position what shouldn't even exist is ridiculous. God, it, it boggles the mind. It's like listening to the, the, the Tory party and it's like listening to the Labour party over there in, in this occasion because you can inter interchange this. Because in the Parliament, you're saying that you shouldn't be using executive jets. But here, the, the Tory party says you shouldn't be using the executive vehicles. I agree with them on this. I agree with you in Parliament. It's bonkers. It's just ridiculous. I agree with all of you, but I'm going to vote for the motion. Um, because it's, it, given, given, the, given the pertinency of, 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 of what climate we're living in, 40 some odd grand is quite a lot of, of money to some, some people. 40 some odd grand is a lot of money. If, if, if people, I mean, I'm going to use most of this on my, on my election, um, on my, on my, on my election re-election campaign because it's ridiculous. People are not going to accept 
that it's acceptable for some people in this council to use executive vehicles to jet around the city. When other people go to work, use public transportation, use bikes, use uh, the, the um, electric scooters, it, it's just not going to wash, Graham. And I think you know it deep down it's not going to wash. But you're just stuck in your ways, my friend. You just don't want to admit yet, but like free, like free meals, you'll eventually pull through and you'll get rid of the cars. Because while we lead, you follow. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien. You never fail to disappoint. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If you think the meeting's crackers up you now, I'm going, I'm going to take it to another level. I'm going to be super environmentally friendly, but this does come with a health warning. Madam Mayor, I believe someone gave you a red envelope earlier. In that red envelope is the last word of my speech, right? I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say the last word of my speech when I get to read it out. I haven't started yet. Because this is, what I'm going to do now is, it, it doesn't use paper, it doesn't use electric, it's not digital, mental telepathy. That's the future. Now, if this works, right, there'll be no mere arguments. And what I'm going to do when I read my speech out, I'm going to send out what I call mind beams. So anybody with a weak mind, leave the room. Now, obviously, the more intelligent, like the 5G councillors, will be able to get this information quicker when I'm <laughs> sending the mind beams out. But just to give you an example of something that was said 170 years ago and stands the test of time, because that didn't last two minutes once the Prime Minister flew from London to Leeds. Totally, it's just a headline grabber. So if this works in here tonight, We'll be on the front page of the Echo. Madam Mayor, I'm beginning now. To help educate those responsible for this silly motion and to hopefully ensure it doesn't happen again, can you feel anybody failing anything yet? Yeah. Right? And hopefully ensure it doesn't happen again. I want to give this council a really good example to follow. A written statement that has not only stood the test of time, but it's possibly even more relevant a dear than when it was written over 170 years ago by a very famous Sunderland woman. Her name was Peggy Potts. A bit of background on... What? Madam Mayor. Come is sir? the word pontoon? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Madam, hang on, don't, oh, no, no, wouldn't, wouldn't that, if, if that word's written on that envelope, Madam Mayor, when I'm finished, we'll be global, we'll, we've achieved something special, and I can say now the whole council's thinking, pond ends, right, so we'll just carry on. And we'll see when we get to the end, if that, if you this there. is telepathy, this is the future, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Peggy Potts, Madam Mayor, and if they go and help us, there's a picture, there's a picture painting by S.E.H. Bell, features Peggy Potts sitting down the fish key selling fish because Peggy's husband died when she was 50 and in them days when they steered benefits, he either worked, starved or went in the workhouse. So she was selling fish. So, Madam Mayor, Peggy sold fish, and she also done a bit of smuggling as well. But that, that's another story. So, around the 1850, there was about to be an election in Sunderland, and Peggy produced and circulated a pamphlet around the town. 
Bear in mind, before she became Peggy Potts, she was Margaret Havelock, a second cousin of General Havelock, who we're got a big statue and all that too. But she was from the poorer side of the family. So is this still true 170 years after? And this is what she put in her pamphlet. Don't vote Tory. The tell lies can't be trusted and only look after the friends. An example of the tell lies today, Boris's red bus, 350 million to the NHS. The NHS is in chaos now. Can I get a doctor, dentist or a consultant? The ambulance workers and nurses are on strike. So that's still true after 170 years. Boris got finished though because he was celebrating. He's an example of look after the friends. Was he celebrating at his party because he just awarded a man the chairmanship of the BBC? The very same man who got him an £800,000 loan. Or was he celebrating his Tory cronies who... Point of order, Mary Sunland. Yes, thank you. I was just querying with uh, my advice. We are seem to be drifting from the point of the debate, the point Councillor is I'm Wilson. Giving, I'm, I'm giving a proper statement. This is a ridiculous statement. I'm giving okay. you a proper statement, Madam Mayor. It's not... Uh, it's, uh, we need it to be more relevant to the matter being debated, and I'm you are rapidly running out of time. Uh, yes, and I'm still sending out the beams to see oh, if no. anybody... You're forgetting them. So... For those, well, we'll change it then. For them councillors and who's never heard of Peggy Potts, right? I hope you agree she's a very interesting person. And the best way of preserving the memory of Peggy Potts and people like her is by people getting back on boats on the river by installing lots and lots of... Point of order, 13.6, Mayor. Let's, yes, let's go to the question. Let's time. put this to the vote, shall we? We will stop, yes. Thank you very much, councillor. We open the envelope. Madam Mayor, we're quite happy to go to the vote if it helps Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, we've twice been asked to move to the vote. We have agreement, but Councillor Mullen does have the right of reply before we do that. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor, and let me return us from the realm of the psychoactive back to the present world and respond to some of the points that have been made in, in the debate. Um, first of all, Paul, what's happened? They are climate deniers as well. You're going to have to extend the list. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why several Labour councillors raised security concerns about the mayor, but didn't seem to think there were security implications of the Prime Minister travelling by public transport. Um, not sure I'll get to understand either. Um, Councillor, you can't have the Prime Minister getting on a bus, Graham. If the mayor has to have an executive car, the Prime Minister can't travel by bus. Councillor Scott car. highlighted that the mayor would lose 101 minutes if she was not to travel by executive car. And I would simply ask the Labour group, is 101 minutes not worth it to save the planet? Yeah. Clearly, I'm sorry, Paul, but they don't think so. It must be very difficult for you. Um, somebody mentioned that the doomsday clock was at 90 seconds to midnight. That is correct, and it's partly to do with the environmental crisis, which the Labour group will now worsen. Um, Somebody raised how much the civic chains are worth. Uh, I hadn't thought of it, but I will look into it ready for our budget amendment, which will help us bring down council tax in the city. Um, somebody said, where do the Conservatives get their maths from? There would be 75 councillors driving to collect agenda packs. Uh, no, it wouldn't, because this proposes that the majority of us would have them sent through electronically. So only a few of us would be driving in, mm. if necessary. Um, Councillor yeah, Butler says. said that change happens at the level of the individual, which is a very conservative thing to say, Michael. Um, <laughs> at, as it happens, we do have a vacancy if you're interested. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think I, I think what what he meant to say as a good socialist is that it will take a communitarian effort to deliver meaningful structural change, and that change can't happen at the level of the individual. But it's sad that he hasn't supported this because I think he clearly agreed with it. Um, I'm, I, I would slightly query Councillor Gibson's claim that the cars have been with us since the council was formed, because I think the lease is actually quite new on the three cars that are currently sitting in. I, I, I think they're newer than that as well. I think the leases are fairly recent. Um, it, I'm very grateful to Councillor Curtis as well for his eventual support. I was a bit worried for, for Niall there as he strained as the whip was potentially broken, but uh, I think he eventually landed on the right side of the argument. And uh, ju just a final point in response to Councillor Wilson, which is quite difficult to do because I'm not quite sure of what you said, Denny. Um, I, I, I tried my best, but the beams didn't quite reach this side of the chamber. <laughs> Further problems with the acoustics for Paul to look into. But since, since the claim was made on the side of the bus, uh, there has been more than £350 million a year put into the NHS. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, everyone. We will now move to an electronic vote on this motion. So if the governance officer could confirm, please, that the vote is running. The vote's running now, members. The vote will be closing shortly. And if we could close the vote now, please. So there are 29 votes in favour, one abstention and 39 votes against. So the motion is defeated. Thank you. Our next notice of motion, I've been advised, has been withdrawn, but Councillor Haswell would like to pass a comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to um, welcome the Council yet again adopting a Liberal Democrat policy and making an improvement to the city. And I look forward to many other opportunities for adopting Liberal Democrat policies. Thank you. One moment, Councillor Leader. Point of order, Madam Mayor, that's completely wrong. The reason that they withdrew this was they knew we were going to just move a motion to close it down because we've delivered everything as a council that they've got in the motion of motion like it was their own idea. And I'm disappointed that Councillor Haswell would try, try and be as cheap try and be as cheap on that as possible. We've delivered on this already, and there is no need for him to comment on it at all, Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Point okay, of order, thank you. what rule is he citing? A what point of clarification, Councillor O'Brien. Every time, every time you right. speak, Councillor O'Brien, Councillors, where is I your think point it's time we moved on, please. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Haswell, do you have anything more to add, or was that it? I think I about covered it. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Our next, thank you. Our next notice of motion addressing discrimination of cared for children. Um, I call upon Councillor Farthing to read and move the motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> Councillors on both the Children Learning and Skills Scrutiny Committee and the Corporate Parenting Board have drawn to their have had drawn to their attention the discrimination that our cared for and care experienced children and young people experience on a regular basis. The public sector equality duty requires public bodies such as councils to, to eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment and victimisation of people with protected characteristics. The council therefore resolves to recognise that cared for and care experienced people are a defined group who face discrimination. The Council has a duty to put the needs of such people at the heart of decision-making through co-production and collaboration. 
Henceforth, future decisions, services and policies made and adopted by the Council should be assessed through the equality impact assessments to determine the impact of changes on people with care experience alongside those who formerly share a protected characteristic. In the delivery of the public sector equality duty, the Council includes care experience in the publication and review of equality objectives and the annual publication of information relating to people who share a protected characteristic in services and employment. And henceforth, this Council will treat care experience as if they were a protected characteristic and formally call upon all other bodies if, par if partners or contracts with to treat care experience as protected characteristics until such time as it may be introduced by legislation. Proactively seek out and listen to the voices of care experienced people when developing new policies. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Price, do you second the motion? I second the motion and reserve the right to reply. Thank you. Councillor Farthing, would you wish to speak on the motion? Uh, what I'm going to read out is the letter that was sent to the members of the Change Council who sit on the Corporate Parenting Board. And it's really to all of us. So it says, Dear Corporate Parents, we are writing to bring to your attention an issue that we believe would improve outcomes for all care experienced people across our local authority. We are aware of the nine current protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010. Age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage or civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. This act protects people from being discriminated against due to these characteristics in a range of situations such as the workplace, when buying or renting a property, and public services, amongst others. We believe that care experience should be a protected characteristic, and we urge Sunderland City Council to follow the example of other city councils, such as Manchester uh, City Council, Cumberland Council, Westmoreland Council, and uh, Westmoreland and Furness Council, and Ashfield District Council, who have already voluntarily introduced care experience as a protected characteristic. This also follows the recommendations in this independent review of children's social care, which suggests that the government should make this into law. This would make the UK the first country in the world to recognise care experience in this way. We would like to be ahead of this by Sunderland City Council voluntarily showing their support for care experienced people, as we know they have done in the past. We are very aware in our daily lives how we can be treated differently due to being, in, being due, sorry, due to being care experienced young people. We believe that if Sunderland were to support us by making care experience a protected characteristic, this would help protect us from discrimination and harassment based on our care identity. We see, the we see the main benefits of making care experience a protected characteristic as follows. It ensures that discrimination for people who, who are care experienced are treated in the same way as discrimination against anyone with the existing protected characteristics. It will raise people's awareness of the discrimination faced by care experienced people and the importance of supporting us. And it allows corporate parenting and equality and diversity work to be closely linked. Most importantly for us, this support and protection would be with us throughout our entire lives. There are different layers of protection in our early life, but a lot of this ends when we reach 25. This protection would form an underlying support which stays with us throughout our adult life and ensures that our care identity does not impact on our future prospects. By making care experience a protected characteristic, this allows businesses, employers and policymakers to put in place policies which promote better outcomes for care experienced people. We understand that not everyone may be comfortable sharing their past care experience in this way and that would still be up to them to decide in the same way that any of the other nine characteristics can be disclosed at that person's discretion. However, it ensures that for those who do choose to declare their past care experience, they are not at risk of being discriminated by this. They would also be supported in, in ensuring that it does not impact their life in a negative way. We also feel that this, link this links well with the pr 
project that we, that's the Change Council, are exploring with the younger group on the training videos around education and post-16 education routes. They highlight the stigma and difficulties that care experiencing people can face. We believe that with your support as our supportive parenting partnership or corporate parents, we can take this further and encourage Sunderland City Council to implement this with our local area. By making care experience a protective characteristic, this would demonstrate Sunderland's commitment to supporting the outcome of care experienced people and promoting high aspirations for us without the fear of discrimination for our care identity. In addition, it offers us more stability in our education and work lives and support us as we move into independent adulthood. We hope you to have your support and to work with you around this important campaign. Yours faithfully, Change Council, 16 plus years. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I understand that Councillor Paul Gibson wishes to move an amendment. Is that the case? Will you please give it now? Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. For moving the amendment, I'd like to um, compliment the movers of the original motion on a um, motion that, if fully implemented, will transfer transform the prospects of young people in care in the city. Basically, the amendment is um, a bolt-on addition to the final bullet point. It's a new bullet point, and it reads as follows. The Council requests that the Chief Executive writes to our local members of Parliament requesting that they a, either support or introduce legislation to amend the Equality Act 2010 to extend the list of protected characteristics to include children and young people leaving care. B, to support the provision of a universal basic income for young people leaving care, to give them a helping hand for dealing with expenses such as accommodation and subsistence. This council notes that such a system has been introduced by the Welsh Parliament on a trial basis. A pleasure in moving this amendment, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Curtis, do you second this amendment? I do second the amendment, Madam Mayor, and I also reserve the right to speak later on. Thank you. Would you like to speak, Councillor? Thank you. Uh, um, there's been a, a lot of research into problems faced by children in care and or people leaving care. For example, the Drive Forward Foundation calls for care experience to be a, protect, to be a protective characteristic, to protect them from stigma and indirect discrimination. Much of the discrimination is unintentional. For example, <clears throat> a teacher may have lower expectations and aspirations for a pupil who's coming out of care or is in care, they may suggest, well, don't you think physics is rather a difficult subject to take? Why don't you try and do this subject instead? Or on a maths paper, they may enter them for a, um, a paper where the cutoff point is a grade C, maximum you can achieve. I actually know someone who um, had that treatment meted out to them. As I say, it's usually done with the best of intentions. Um, be cautious. Don't overreach yourself. <clears throat> and it's often influenced by the child's unsupportive or non-existent home environment. Result. Of 18 to 21-year-olds, care leavers, only 6% get to university. And once there, they're twice as likely to drop out, usually due to economic pressures. In employment, they're often made to reveal their background, resulting in the problems just described. Article 39, another pressure group, focused on 16 to 17 year olds, arguing that they're in many ways as vulnerable as younger children. For example, 22 children aged 16 to 17 living in property without any adult carer between, the age, between 2018 and 2020 died. 66% of these children in care have suffered from some form of abuse or neglect. A review by the Children's Commission of 2020 found that teenagers in care frequently lived with 
vulnerable adults who were often drug or alcohol addicts, had mental health issues, or had even been in prison. Whereas 1.4% of the UK population is care experienced, care experienced people amount to 25% of the homeless and prison populations. The Department of Education did research of its own, and it revealed that 60% of children in care aged 16 to 17 lived in, lived in properties without day-to-day -day care or consistent or adult supervision. 90 children aged 15 or under lived in similar accommodation. Over 50% of those in care um, accommod less accommodation were from ethnic minorities and 70% of them were boys. Ofsted then decided to do its own research and came up with identical conclusions. Children and young people now, another pressure group, urged making care experience a 10th protected characteristic, making the UK the first country to do this and it would extend full protection from discrimination under the Equality Act 2010. At present, they have to try and prove discrimination on some other ground, for example, maybe gender or race or whatever. Children and young people now agree, refer, agree referring to, to care leavers under representation in universities, particularly prestigious one, their under-representation in apprenticeships but they're overrepresented among the homeless and people with low life expectancy. The case for extending protection from discrimination, no matter how well intentioned, is clear. But what about the question of a universal basic income for care leavers? By definition, most care leavers have little or no family support to fall back on. Lack of finance leads to real difficulties when entering the world of employment and higher education. For example, accommodation. They often need to provide a deposit on rented accommodation. There's the rent to pay, subsistence, travel to and from work. Um, <clears throat> particularly a problem if they have to travel to a different town or even region for work or uh, education. These problems may well be a big factor in the above average dropout rate of care leavers in university. The Welsh Parliament was convinced by these arguments and introduced a UBI. Uh, Councillor Gibson, it's your five minutes are up. Can you motion to up, extend, please? Madam Mayor? I've almost finished, Madam Mayor. Yes, um, yes please. Carry it's on. not a giveaway. What it re doesn't it replaces all other benefits. It's stopped if you go to prison. It only lasts for two years, and it's roughly in line with a living wage. And in Wales, it applies to 518-year-olds. And it's an interesting experiment. I uh, move the amendment, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. I understand that Councillors McKeith, Eyre, uh, Mann and Scott have indicated that they wanted to speak on the motion. Uh, would you indicate, please, if you wish to speak on the amendment? Substantive, please. So, Madam Mayor, that's just Councillor Farthing who has a right of reply to the amendment. Oh, sorry, no. Councillor no. Wilson. I, I just wanted to say, Madam Mayor, that uh, Councillor Gibson did speak to me and I was quite happy with these amendments and I'm sure that my party will also support them. Uh, thank you. Okay. Councillor Wilson, do you still wish to speak? I'm, I'm not sure if this is to the amendment or... or this what. is for the amendment. Yeah, but I, I just want to share this one with the council. One of the most emotional things that happened to me as a councillor was that the, the children, when they come to Tartia, one of them said, we're not bad kids. Why is it when we're poor out? You put us in the worst places to live. And these kids, you're very lucky if you've never wanted to borrow a fiver off somebody or something like that. They've got nobody to turn to. You know, and sometimes if they do borrow money, it comes with strings attached. So anything that can help these kids will be great. Thank you. 
Um, it's looking like the amendment will be agreed. Can I ask your agreement on that? Agreed. Thank you. So the new motion will read with the amendment in it. Um, I would now like to give the opportunity for those who wish to speak to still speak on the substantive motion. So um, as there, we have councillors McKeith, Eyre, Mann and Scott. Is there anyone else wishes to speak? Madam Mayor. Sorry. Councillor Guy. Madam Mayor, sorry, if I Councilor could just... Guy. Sorry, Councillor If I could just mention that Councillor McKeith is no longer in the meeting, so we won't be oh. able to speak. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you know, I thought I just couldn't see him. Yeah. Did Councillor Johnston have his hand up? Yeah. So, Madam Mayor, um, if I can just check, I've got councillors Eyre, Mann, Ian Scott, Guy and Johnston. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Eyre, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to start by saying that I welcome and fully support this motion. Madam Mayor, it's over 20 years ago now that I changed direction in my nursing career and I became a health visitor. In that role, we work to protect children against discrimination and all the other issues and evils that they had to deal with. These were children that were cared for, vulnerable, and whoever needed our help. There's nothing new about discrimination. It's as old as the hills and all the other issues that these young people have to face. I think this motion, it's important because it's what I consider a starting point. A starting point to look at other and more in-depth issues faced by children who are cared for, vulnerable or whoever. We need to identify these issues and as Councillor Farthen mentioned, we need to involve everybody that has something to do with their care. The children themselves, other carers, and whoever we need to listen to. We need to think about exploring new approaches to meet all needs. Not being scared to break the mould, to think new and to think different. The courage to ask possible questions that we have to raise once we get the information, and to brace for possible difficult answers. I started in Shower Start over in Southwick 20 years ago, and this and all those problems they existed. They exist today, and I'm sad to say they're going to exist in the future, whatever steps we take. And this is going to happen because no child has any influence over the circumstances they're born into or the family. So I applaud this motion. I think it's a great starting point. Let's think better, let's think greater, because these young people deserve it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mann. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, very happy to support the motion and the amendment. Uh, and I'm going to keep this very brief because it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Discrimination is not to be tolerated anywhere for anything by anybody. Discrimination is not right in the country, in the UK, against anybody. Um, our protected children, our cared for children are protected because they're looked after, because they're cared for, because of reasons that are not their own fault. So we don't want to add to that by discriminating further against them. Um, what we don't want to do, I believe, is label them either. Um, we, we need to set um, a level that we're not adding to it by saying, well, you were in care, so therefore you have a protected characteristic. I think that's um, going a wee bit too far. Um, but I agree, I agree with everything that is being said and will be said eloquently by members of the scrutiny committees. Um, yes, I support it. Yes, it should be supported. Um, as I say, keeping it brief, but let's not label people. Um, that, that's the only point I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Ian Scott, please. Thank you once again, Madam Mayor. Uh, this motion is truly welcome, and I promise I will keep it brief. 
We must do everything that we can as a council to ensure that discrimination or the mere potential for it, whether unconscious or intentional, is not present or prevalent in any strategic or operational decisions that we make. I absolutely welcome the proposal that care experience is treated exactly like one of the nine protected characteristics outlined in the Equality Act of 2010. And I also welcome the amendment from the Liberal Democrats that uh, we perhaps lobby government to consider a change in the law so that this positive ramification can be felt beyond the confines of our city and to the wider UK as also. Every child deserves the opportunity to shine. But the precursor to that is ensuring that they have both the equal and equitable opportunity to do so. Madam Mayor, I'm in full support of the motion and I hope that many colleagues around the room are also likely inclined to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Guy. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, the motion itself and the cross-party support for it really matches what myself and other colleagues feel on the Children's Scrutiny Committee. Um, in fact, um, we're going to have soon a deep drive on the care for children. And also, members of that committee know that I particularly have a bit of a beam of bonnet about um, care for children, their access to employment education and training and it is we are deeply looking into it and seeing how we can connect it to the two because unfortunately um, and uh, myself and Louise have previously spoke about this about how people with how who have cared for backgrounds unfortunately do struggle to have access in into enter employment and other things so I, I just think that this motion and its cross-party support really embodies not only the ethos of all the parties and this chamber itself, but I really think it does justice as this as an institution towards the cared for children that we all, our corporate parents, want to look after. So I just want to say that it's really um, inspiring that across all parties, we can really collectively work on this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Johnston. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll uh, start by apologising on behalf of Councillor McKeith. He have, had to leave the meeting just before the start. Um, he's feeling unwell, um, so had to go home. He's asked me firstly, in his capacity as our Conservative spokesman on children's issues, to read out a few comments on his behalf, and then I'll move on to a few thoughts of my own. Thank you. Um, Josh um, wanted to firstly say this is a fantastic motion and it's good to see that the young people who've been involved in the creation and the development of it, and that was clear in the letter read out by Louise, which was really impactful. Several meetings ago, corporate parenting, Josh noted that young people raised the issue of discrimination and detailed the example of a young person who had been discriminated against by a private company when they were going for a job on the grounds of the fact they were care experienced, which he noted was disgusting. He's glad that the council's taking the action to be at the forefront at trying to improve this situation and he hopes that other partners will look at what we're doing tonight and themselves work to see how they can be fairer to care experienced people within our city. Looking at my thoughts on it, I think this is a good motion. I welcome the amendment from the Lib Dems and I think it's right we're supporting that. I think we have to look at the practicalities of it. If we are going to support grand policies like universal basic income, how it's going to work is important. It's great that we're writing, we're looking at innovative solutions. You know, this is bold, it's welcome, it's good to look at things, but we have to look at the practicalities because a lot of people outside this chamber will just think, oh, well, this is money for nothing. This is a lot of money being spent without actually itself being tested for outcomes. So I think if we go forward supporting this, let's work together cross-party on how this should work, what we should be aiming to do, but what a great start, and thank you to everyone for being so cooperative. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Price, you reserved the right to speak. Would you like to do so? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to second the motion this evening, which has been proposed so eloquently by the portfolio holder, Councillor Farthing. And as we've all heard, outlining the details and solid reasons we should support this motion this evening. And again, in the last five minutes, we've heard other reasons why that should be done. I'll be brief, Madam Mayor. The formal definition, as we've heard, of protected characteristics is simply, it is against the law to discriminate against someone due to the nine characteristics. 
And under the Equality Act 2010, we all should be observing that in every daily life. Discrimination should not be allowed in any way. We all, as members of this council, have the duty of corporate pairing corporate parenting for all our cities cared for children. So it's very obvious we should seek to treat the care experience as a protective characteristic in all business and dealings. Just think of it in our own daily life, how we support our own families, how we encourage them, and how we would fail if we found out they were subject to some sort of discrimination. In Sunderland, just so you're aware, we currently have a care for a population of 499, which is children and young people under the age of 18 years old. Then we have 221 young adults aged 18 to 25 who are care experienced and are still accessing support with our Next Step service. That's 700 people who are looking towards this council for their support. At any one time nationally, Madam Mayor, statistics show that in 2022, there were 400,000 children in the social care system, and more than 80,000 of these are children in care today. So we see it's, it's a major issue in our lives. In simple terms, at present, there are currently 700 young people in Sunderland relying on us. We are their family. And on meeting some of these youngsters, as Councillor Farthing highlighted, and chatting, we have we've heard their stories. And as any youngster, they are keen to move on. They are thankfully, many of them, very ambitious and hopefully finding their desired employment. However, they report, just as we've heard this evening, that perhaps in interview situations with prospective employees, as soon as the conversation involves family situations and they learn that they cared for children, the interview sometimes takes a different change and indeed quickly concludes. Such a stigma we must do everything to eradicate. I would ask all members to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Farthing, do you wish to exercise your right of reply? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm pleased that it seems that the whole council will support the amended motion and I'm, I'm delighted with that and I will we'll be reporting back to our colleagues on the, on the change council. Um, we, we do have corporate parenting training being developed at the moment and I know that the corporate parenting board members have been invited to take part in that training just to test it out. I think it's going to be very similar to what we've had before, but I've asked that uh, the Director of Children's Services, Jill Colbert, ensures that gets into members' training programme for an annual refresh at, at, at the same time as safeguarding. It's important that we all understand what our corporate parenting responsibilities are. Um, previously, um, the, the Change Council did develop the training and it, and, and it was very impactful. I'd also like to draw uh, Council's attention to other work that the Change Council has done on behalf of cared for and care experienced young people. They have launched something called Change the Language Campaign. Now, if you've not heard about that, I would ask all of you to ensure that you do understand that there is a difference in the language that we should use. We shouldn't refer to care leavers, we should talk to about people who are care experienced. And it does take a while to get your head around it. But when I first was involved as a member looking at children in the cared for system, they, were, they had this label of LAC, local authority cared for, which is a horrible terminolo terminology. And then that's been changed to uh, cared for children. And now we've got care, a different, different sort of um, terminology altogether. The other thing that, we, that our young people asked us to sort of look at was the fact that we used to talk about 
um, putting in the mid, it wasn't a home that we put them in, it was a, a, a different word, I've forgotten what it was now because I've got so used to using the word home. But it is, it's something that we, could, we can all look at and sort of use that new language and encourage others to use it because I have challenged uh, at my governing body that the head teacher was still using terminology which I didn't feel was appropriate but that has changed because I have been persistent, because I've done my duty as a corporate parent. So I would you know, ask you all to look at that language and ensure that it is spread across the city, because that would actually be, be doing something that our corporate children have asked us to do. So I would like now, I think, to uh, wind up and thank everyone for their support tonight and the uh, different things that people have said and to, be, and to show that they are aware of the needs of our corporate children. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Farley. <laughs> Can I ask if Council is agreed on the new substantive motion? Agreed. Thank you very much, everybody. We have reached seven o'clock. We are now timed out. Um, any business not concluded tonight will be carried forward. Can I thank you all for a very vibrant meeting and say that for tonight we are concluded. Thank you. <laughs>